I have a different setup on the screen. I noticed that I could make us full picture. So I've got you full and ready to go, which is great because it's much better than the last one. Okay. All right. So I'm, we're starting. I'm recording. So let's pray real quick um, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Come into our hearts, into our minds, into our souls and take over this conversation. Have us talk about whatever you want your children to hear. And Jesus, please pour your precious blood on this conversation and protect us from any outside forces that don't want you to talk, us to talk about what you want us to speak out loud. And all of this through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, may you protect us, guide us, and lead us, as always, to your Son's sacred heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, well, part three. <laughs> it's been a while. I'm not sure if you even remember what we spoke about, because I know you do a lot of interviews. All right, don't worry about it. You just sit back, and I'll just start peppering you with questions. Okay, but, good uh, Yeah, for one, I know that we do need to get into specifically how you were converted. That was one thing that you kind of talked about briefly, but I really want to get into that because I think that's the beauty of this whole entire journey of yours. Um, but I've had a lot of people reach out and wanted me to ask you a couple of specific questions about okay. how, yeah. So, hey, by the way, all you viewers and listeners in every single description box on my YouTube channel, you will see two interviews with Zachary King that you can watch, that you can get his true story from beginning to end, not that we're talking about false stories here, but his his story from beginning to end from EWTN and LifeSite News. So just click in the description box and you can watch those because we've been all over the map. And I think it's great because the Holy Spirit's, I believe, leading us. And now our listeners <laughs> and viewers are going to lead us. What should people look out for? I've had a person mention that her husband, who was a bus driver, had someone on her bus say something like, hey, I'm a witch or something to that degree, and then jumped off the bus. You know, like, I don't think many of us have had someone blatantly call out that they're a witch or that maybe that they've been cursed. So what are some things that we can look for when we're not really familiar with what to look for? Are you familiar with the pentagram? I am. Okay. Well, one point out. For those who don't, go ahead and get into whatever detail you, you must get into, please. Well, it, it's, it's a five-sided star that usually has a circle around it. And one side up is New Age and Wiccan. Two sides up is Satanic. So, And you'll tell by the two sides up, it looks like devil horns. And then it looks like the devil's got a goatee. Um, so two sides up is a blatant Satanist that's standing right in front of you. That if you're in the know, you know what he is. And if you're not in the know, you think, oh, cool necklace. Um, so you're talking about a necklace, a tattoo, something, on um, a, a T-shirt with it? T-shirts. There's In the last 10 years, there's been a resurgence in the cult the OTO and there's OTO t-shirts that are sold like at places that sell rock and roll t-shirts, which I'm surprised they haven't showed up at Walmart or target yet because both of right. those places, right. satanic stuff. <laughs> you know, the, I surprised everybody probably five years ago. I told people that the, that walmart.com, I was looking up what's the biggest TV I can get. Me being blind, I want a huge TV so I can see everything. And my TV is 65 inches. But they sell one at Walmart that's 165 inches. Oh. You need 14 feet of wall space to have it. When I first looked it up, I had 14 feet of wall space. But I look ahead and I thought, no, oh, that's not a guarantee that my next place will have this much room. And it was a good thing I didn't buy it because my next place didn't have 14 feet of wall space. But when I was looking that up, I then looked up, let's see if they have my book here. And they do have my, they have my book, Abortion is a Satanic Sacrifice. 
And I was like, well, that's cool. And then down at the bottom of the page, it said other things you might be interested in since you were interested in this book. And they have these statues that go anywhere from six inches to three feet. And I know you're thinking they're Catholic. They're not. It's the Baphomet statue. Oh. Walmart.com sells the Baphomet statue. You can get one up to three feet high. Uh, they also sell a Baphomet plush and a Baphomet coloring book for children. You know, you wouldn't want to leave the children out. Yeah, right. Oh, of course. Go, go for the kids. Okay, right. so back to the pentagram. There's two things I want to mention is because some people may not even know that that is satanic. So what if they buy that thinking it's just cool and they buy the coloring book for their kids? Are they inviting Satan and you're, demons into them? You are. You're, you're inviting the evil one right into your house and you're inviting them to your children. Now, I've never seen the coloring book. I don't know what's in it. I don't know if they have actual magic spells in it or magic words that your children are supposed to say. There's, um, oh, who is it? It's some, some random store, but, but they, they have a witchcraft section. I think it's, um, my kids like to shop there. It's like everything $5 or $5 and under or something like that is the title. And they have a book section that has, it's full of witchcraft books. And in there, they have spell casting for children. And in their spell casting, they show you very simple spells for children to say. And some of it looks like nonsensical words and really basically would be if you weren't saying a magic spell. Is that store called Five Below? Five Below, that's it. Okay, wow, wow. Okay, so go back to that pentagram and you were saying that with the two points up and the other one with the one point up is the witchcraft? Because that's well, kind of new to me. One one point up is Wiccan. Wiccan. And, it, and it's also New Age. Two points up is Satanic. Okay. So two okay. points up is called an inverted pentagram. Two points up is an inverted pentagram. Right. The regular pentagram is Wiccan and New Age. And you had the best description of what New Age was. Um, I'm going to let you say it in a second, but I just think about whatever's on TV when you have people sitting Indian style with their, you know, fingers and they're going, oh, um, um, when you're doing Hindu yeah. and Buddhism and chakras yeah. and anything that they say is normal on a commercial is not normal unless it's on EWTN. Um, you know, there's, there's places that, you know, I, I am a big fan of Scooby-Doo. And the original Scooby Doo came out in the '60s, and it was always a man in a mask. You know, there wasn't anything real. To, you know, the witch wasn't real. The, the monsters weren't real. The ghosts weren't real. You know, of course, to shoot Shaggy and Scooby, they're scared of everything. But it always turns out to be a man in a mask. And like the in one of my favorite episodes, it had like a Frankenstein creature in it and a witch, and the Frankenstein creature had a long pole with a metal tip on it. And they had stolen an armored car full of money and hid it in the swamps. And they didn't know where, they couldn't remember where. So he would take the metal pole and stick it in the water, look, listening for a clanging sound on metal. And it that turned out to be that, that was how they solved the case. But, and Frankenstein was a man in a mask, but in later episodes, like way later, like after the 2000s, they started putting uh, inverted pentagrams or pentagrams or dream catchers in almost every episode. Like every episode had something new age on it. Hmm. You know, dream and catchers. talk dream, about that. Dream catcher is Native American and it's designed to catch the bad dreams while you're asleep. It captures them in the dream catcher so that you hopefully will only have good dreams. The problem is it's if they're real, it's been blessed by a shaman and a shaman is a really nice way of saying witch. Um, and all witches are satanic, no matter what they believe. Witchcraft is not an acceptable practice in the Bible. You know, you have 33 verses where God tells you not to do these things. Mm -hmm. 
and shamanistic magic, even if the person doing the magic doesn't believe in God, the devil, heaven, or hell, Satan still believes in you. Yeah, and if you're practicing his craft, he's going to help you with it. You know, and so what, doing. What's your doing definition of, I'm sorry. We always, I always have this delay when I talk to you, and I'm so mad because you, you, you stop, and then I think, oh, I can interject, and then I'm sorry if I'm cutting you off out there. But keep going, and then I'll ask my question, and then I'll go ahead and ask the question. So you had mentioned. So I said, what is New Age? And you described it so simply, and I don't know if you any, remember what you said. Any religion that takes out God, the devil, heaven, or hell. Bingo. Bingo. So when I think that I can just go out and call on the power of the universe. You're speaking to a demon. Out. Go ahead. You're speaking to a demon. The, the, oh. the, the, the universe is God. You know, if, if you want to speak to somebody in the universe, speak to God. He made it. Right. Why would you That's why right. would you think I'm gonna to speak to one of the creatures in the universe? Because God made everything. Why not just speak to the creator? Exactly. You know, it's like That's the, the druids, the druids worshiping trees. Why don't you worship the person that made the trees? Yeah, by the way, people don't say knock on wood and, you know, because that is what the Druids did. And then the, they were trying to get the spirits out of the tree. So take that little phrase out of your language. Because I used to do that all the time and I would knock on my own head like knock on wood. I don't do that anymore um, because I know now. Another thing that's, that we've incorporated into our Christmas, and a lot of people have it, but it's also Druid, is the mistletoe. Kissing under the mistletoe is a druid practice. Oh, I didn't know that. So, what did they do under the mistletoe? Would trying to conjure up? I, I think it's I think it's some kind of um, bringing more life. Like it's a, uh, I can't think of what that's called, but it's they're trying to conjure life, which would basically mean standing under the mistletoe is going to encourage sex, and you're going to have you know have a child but um i think it's from a pagan perspective yeah and then you talk about kissing under a mistletoe which then could lead to other things <laughs> kind of makes right. sense oh goodness okay so we all let's just cover the bases when you wore a mood ring as a kid when you had a lucky rabbit's foot all of these things are the magic cult. Cult. yes the magic game. No one thinks that that's witchcraft, but if you're trying to find the answer using something that's not godly. You're breaking the first commandment. Yep. You know, even if your magic eight ball always falls on the same answer, like you shake it up. Am I going to be married next year? It doesn't know. Ask again later. <laughs> and every time you shake it up and ask it a question, it says, ask again later. That's all it ever says. You're still trying to find the answer using something that's not God. Right. Um, I watched before this interview and the last interview, uh, Michael Knowles. He's on uh, Daily Wire and he's got a YouTube channel. And he had a couple of people that were fortune tellers and astrologers. And some other guy who was doing all this hallucinogenic kind of drugs deal. And every single one of them have turned Christian, not necessarily Catholic. Actually, none of them are Catholic. Uh, but they experienced some evil experiences, by the way, everyone. I will put those links of those videos down there if you want to check them out. Because these people think that they are doing good. And right. when they're calling on the future and they're calling on their spirit guide. And I'm using air quotes here for you, Zachary. I mean, they are calling on an evil spirit who in some cases will give them information, but that's not coming from God. And then they all had really bad experiences being attacked and having dreams and seeing, you know, shadows in their rooms and crazy stuff. So talk a little bit about 
that stuff. What's the guy that uh, he contacts the dead? And I can't think of his name, but he says when he, when he has a room full of people, he'll tell one of them somebody has a person standing next to them that's wearing like a fishing hat and is carrying a fishing pole. And he says his name is Charles, you know, and somebody's like, oh, that's my Uncle Charles. And, and Uncle Charles says that you had a secret handshake and something else. And this person is swearing that's their Uncle Charles. And then he'll tell them how happy they are wherever they are. And then this person will go into a story of, I'm so glad to hear he was happy because he was an alcoholic his whole life and killed himself and five other people in a car crash. You know, I was just fearing that he went to hell, you know, but now hearing that he's happy, it, it's good to know that he's in heaven. And it's like, come on, people, you don't really believe this, do you? And that guy claims he's famous. I, I'm, I can't remember his name, but he claims he prays a rosary before he goes out there. And he might do that, but hmm. he's committing a mortal sin every time he does it. Not the rosary, the, you know, doing what yeah. he's channeling, you know, what he's doing. I mean, there, there was a woman in the Old Testament that was stoned to death for channeling. Like, why would it be that? a sin of death now? What's that? What was that? Where was that in the Bible? It's in the Old Testament. Okay. All right. Sorry. Drawing a blank on that. Yeah, and was, that's big. Uh, um, Saul, I think. No, not the okay. Saul from the New Testament. Saul from the Old Testament went and saw her to get some answers of some kind and i think she ended up being stoned to death oh my gosh and i think people just they're so sad and they seek these people out because of hey that's uncle charlie you know he's got the fishing hat and you know this and that and the other right. and and then they get and then they get addicted they just keep coming back and keep coming back that's what these people were saying was you know, unfortunately, we're not telling them anything. We're not healing them, but they're coming back more and more and more because they get that addiction to the little things that, you know, the bad spirits are telling that person. Right. But it also gives them a false hope. If Uncle Charlie never went to mass, never prayed a rosary, never did a novena, never took the Eucharist, never went to confession, and he ended up in heaven, why can't I? Right. Yeah, good you point. Know, why do I have to do all that stuff if Uncle Charlie didn't have to? I mean, you can go into many, you know, Christian false preachers out there, you know, like Joel Olstein rarely Olstein. talks about stuff. The thing that came to mind. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sad, but again, so many people are putting that false hope into the false gospel. And Okay, so back to my question about what can we look for? So I'm just going to say one more thing. I was just listening right before we got on here. Um, 50 things that you should look for, uh, for from evil, from an evil spirit perspective. And mm -hmm. Father Ray Hill um, ended up, uh, Ray Hill, R-E-H-I-L-L, -L, said we should, yeah, do you know him? Yeah. Great guy. Okay, I don't know him, but great stuff. He said, bless everything that you put in your mouth whether it's a vitamin or your food or candy everything everything needs to be blessed everything you and don't know you don't know where it came from you don't know who had it and cursed it before you got it exactly so these are some steps that we can take because i wasn't blessing my supplements um you know some of the protein powders that i would get I would forget to bless it as I was drinking it. I should bless it before I even put it on my shelf. You know, it's just something that we all need to think about because there are people out there, and he had mentioned, keep your kids away from Halloween candy unless you bless it all. You should keep your kids away from candy anyway because you have witches running up and down the aisles at the stores right. putting spells and curses on the candy. Right. I mean, uh, so why? You were You were one of them. Why? What did you get out of it? And what kind of spells were you casting? Like, what are these witches doing and putting on the candy? Um, I didn't do that kind of spells. 
I, I didn't I didn't curse candy, but <laughs> when witches do it, it's to um, open the kids up to being more like to be more susceptible to Harry Potter and to magic and to witchcraft and to think their parents are old fogies and that's just a Catholic belief that they don't even believe in anymore, you know, and you're allowed to do magic now, you know, and if the, your parents say not to do it, go ahead and do it. It's no big deal. You know, disobeying your parents isn't any big deal. It's in the Ten Commandments, but look how old those things are. Those things are like 4,000 years old. You don't have to follow those rules anymore. You know, and it just, it whittles away at their innocence. Got it. Okay, so then you don't, you didn't do that to Candy. What did you do? Most of my spells were for people that hired me to do spells. So I could do spells for money or take over, hostile takeover of a business. Um, <coughs> somebody that wants a nice car, but not just any nice car. Like they want a Bugatti, you know, or they want a Lamborghini or something like that. Um, or they wanted a Rolls Royce. They wanted a Rolls Royce limousine. You know, they wanted a Rolls Royce limousine that's not made anymore. You know, it's like from 1940 or something like that. And, and they had their eye on one and they wanted one, but they couldn't afford it. So they wanted it to be affordable. You know, so I would do things like that. Or so would you I, then cast a spell on that guy or gal who wanted that limo? Or how? what would you kind of do to make that happen? Um, that's not a hex type spell. It's just a regular spell. So okay. you've got you've got all your regular stuff, your candles, your knife, your skull, uh, parchment. You've written on it. You've said what the intention is. And then you um, kind of like making a prayer to a demon. And you're saying who the person is that wants it and what they want. And okay. it, it's very basic, humdrum, boring. You know, well, you I didn't know you had a skull and a parchment paper and a knife and candles. I mean... You know, I just thought you were like, oh, yeah, you know, can you give him that limo? So that's good to know that that's not humdrum to me. It's fascinating. You know, like there's a ritual to it. Right. And and if you did something that required a hex, then you have to do an abortion to go with it. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, talk and to me a little bit about your book, by the way, um, because I think I know we've covered this a tiny bit. We We went into your your first abortion and. We didn't talk about how many abortions that you went through to get into the high priest role, but I really do believe that people need to hear that abortion is a satanic sacrifice. And I well, think you even had some proof of that. Don't take my word for it. Take it. Uh, listen to the satanic temple. They say abortion is a satanic sacrifice. They said it. they started saying it in 2022. They put it on their website. If you live in a state that doesn't allow abortion, it's legally against the law. Go on their website and you can print out some prayers that you say before the abortion and after the abortion. And that makes it a protected religious liberty under the things that they believe in. And you sign up to be a member of the Satanic Temple online, pay your fee, and now you're officially a member. And now no state can turn you down for an abortion because it's your religious liberty and religious freedom that gives you the right to have that abortion. So it was them who said that this is our religious freedom abortion. So it was the satanic temple that started that whole thing? Well, they're the ones that started saying it in public. I started saying it in 2011 when I did my first talk. You know, abortion is a satanic sacrifice. I put out my CD set in 2015 and my book in 2018. And then Johnny Come Lately, uh, The Satanic Temple, comes out in 2017. And in 2022, they said abortion is a satanic sacrifice. Like, I've been saying this the whole time. I've been saying it for 11 years. Now they finally caught on and uh, agreed. Although, even though I say it and The Satanic Temple says it, my bishop still won't give me an imprimatur on my book because he doesn't believe abortion is a satanic sacrifice. Does he at least believe it's a mortal sin? <laughs> I don't know if he thinks it's a mortal sin or not. I know that he doesn't believe it's a, a satanic sacrifice. Wow. 
Wow, that's sad. Who's your bishop? And speaking of Michael Knowles, um, honey, when was that interview supposed to be? Supposed to be on February, like in the second week of February. Okay, so the second week in February, Michael Knowles and his team of producers had been in contact with me for a month. And they were very excited because I was supposed to fly there. And I had the option of flying there, spending the night and coming back the next day or flying in and out on the same day. And I chose to do that because I'm on dialysis five days a week. I don't want to miss a day. So I'm flying out in this scenario. I'm flying out the next day. They've been talking to me almost every day. And they're all excited about getting me. And then they said, it says on your website that you have a bishop's letter and reference letters from priests. Could you send us those? Not a problem. So we send them all my stuff. And about 10 minutes later, they sent me back an email and said that they've canceled the flight and there's no reason for me to come now. And so I called them because I thought maybe I'm something's I'm misleading something, mis mistranslating something. So I called them and they said that um, they have a, um, a PR team and the PR team decides who comes and gets interviewed and who doesn't. And they've decided that I'm not going to be interviewed. And I said, are they brand new? Did you just hire them today? Hmm. And he was like, no, why? I said, because you've been talking to me for the last 30 days. In the last 30 days, you guys have been talking about me coming. And now suddenly today, after I send you my references, you decide not to have me. I was just curious why. And the guy told me to hold on, and then he hung up. Oh. I didn't want to hang back. Hmm. I have no idea which one of my references got me booted off the show. Yeah, I mean, I asked you for them, so you emailed them to me. A couple of them didn't have the letterhead, but had phone numbers on it that I thought was good enough. Others did have letterhead. Um, you know, I don't, let's just say I did not interview you because of it, <laughs> but I'm not Daily Wire, I don't know. A couple of them were, were emails. You know, you, yeah. if you're not yeah. gonna send it on company letterhead, you're gonna get an email. You know, yeah, I mean, one, of my, one of my emails is Bishop Coffee. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. So I, I don't know. know which one, I don't know which one kept me off the the interview, but I'm proud of all my my reference letters. Yeah, and interesting that they look and ask the day before you're supposed to fly out there. Right. Why wouldn't you ask this question 30 days ago? Exactly. That would be the first thing, you know, before you get fly, spend any money on anyone. Let's let's see, you know, let's see your references. Interesting. Hmm. Right. Because your your story would be a good one. You know, maybe they'll see it out and about and you should call them back now that it's been a couple of months. Maybe you get a different person. I don't know. You never know. You never know, I guess. Yeah. Well, I had one. Okay. I was I was uh, the first interview I ever gave was on Drew Mariani, and that would have mm -hmm. been like in 2010 or 11. And on the interview, I mentioned Lord of the Flies, Satan having the title Lord of the Flies, and Drew asking me how that title came about, and I said because of like I said, have, do you have a prayer room inside your house? He said, yes. I said, is it an internal room? Like there's no windows or anything that lead outside. He goes, that's correct. I said, have you ever had a fly problem in that room? He said, no. I said, well, some people get it and they'll have, it seems like hundreds of flies and they'll say a St. Michael prayer and then all the flies disappear. I said, it's because Satan is known as, known as Lord of the Flies. So one of his producers didn't like that show so much that he banned me for life from the Drew Mariani show. Really? And then he interviewed me and then I was speaking at Radio Maria 
and it was a father Dan Hohen that interviewed me. And then there was a luncheon after that, and there was like 300 people at the luncheon. And the ladies that came to that luncheon all talked about the Lord of the Flies segment and how that they all have the internal prayer rooms and all of them have had an influx of like a thousand flies and they're everywhere and you can't get rid of them. And then they said a St. Michael prayer and like smoke, they were all gone. And so they knew it was safe like, and they appreciated hearing me say it. I said, you should call the Drew Mariani show and tell them that because I made that statement, I'm banned for life. So I and hear you know it was that you know it was that statement that and by the way for anyone who doesn't know who Drew Mariani is he's on Relevant Radio, it's a radio station um, across America. So did you do you know that that's why you were not invited did back or did you hear that you were banned? Did he send you a note and say you're banned because of this or you just never got a call back? No, he got uh, he called one of the people that helped set up the interview, and his producer did and said, uh, Zachary King is banned for life because he said this story on relevant radio. But I've since then been interviewed six or seven times and they've never banned me again. They've never said I was banned. And Drew seems to like me. So I don't know, I don't know, I'm thinking it was just that producer. Hmm. And this was back when? 2000, either 10 or 11. Oh, way, way, way before. Yeah, I'm way, a regular way. on government radio, so <laughs> on, the mer- on the morning air show. Um, never been on Drew's show, but I was like, oh, I wonder if I know the producer, but that was way before me. So interesting. Interesting. So anyone who has an internal prayer room, I'll be honest with you, never experienced the fly thing, um, mm-hmm. but say the St. Michael prayer. So more about Lord of the Flies. Uh, I had just heard a... An exorcist say, flies don't go into boiling water. So the more that you're praying, the more that you're calling on our Blessed Mother and Jesus, you know, they're, they're going to be staying away from you. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's a satanic thing. Although, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, if you're, if you're really godly, Satan would be afraid to attack you. But that's not exactly true because look at Padre Pio. I was just going to bring him up. Yeah. Yeah, was- because so that's funny because an exorcist did say the same thing. So why, you know, Padre Pio getting physically beat up because he can't, he's not being able to be tempted anymore. He's spiritually, you know, not having it. Uh, St. John Vianney is another one, you know, getting physical beat beat downs by the demons because they can't hurt them spiritually anymore. So they go to the physical. That's kind of what they were saying. I've got a, a friend named Tommy Houlihan and Tommy used to own, um, oh, what's the Times Square? He used to own Times Square tattoos and he got so much attack in Times Square because there's rainbow flags everywhere and, and trannies everywhere and um this abortion rights is just everywhere and he's trying to be a devout catholic and he's traditionalist so he finally moved to pennsylvania and he opened tommy Houlihan's immaculata tattoo the outside of the building is painted blue the inside of the building i think is two-tone blue uh, the priest walked into his shop to bless it, and it's filled. It's wall-to-wall Blessed Mother pictures, holy pictures, a few pictures of tattoo art, but not many. It's mainly the Blessed Mother, and he's got a three-foot Marian statue. And um, he also got half of a church pew in, in, his, in his studio. And the, uh, the priest walked in there and said, it feels holy in here already even without the blessing. He says, and you've got a, a church pew here. It's like you're about to have mass said. Hmm. And so he did the, the blessing and he told him, he says, you're hurting the devil. The devil hates your shop. Now, everybody that walks in gets a blessed miraculous medal, even has prayer cards that gives you a little bit of information about the miraculous medal. And 
his store is surrounded. There's like three or four other tattoo shops there and a couple of new age shops. And the tattoo places all have, they're dark, they have skulls, they have pentagrams, inverted pentagrams, rainbow flags, and all kinds of satanic paraphernalia. The shop across the street from him has a Ouija board in the window and a pentagram. And, you know, it's all these new age and satanic stuff all everywhere. And in the middle of all that, he brought the Blessed Mother. <laughs> and he get the attack he gets is that a lot of people don't frequent his shop. You know, and he, he feels like, you know, his, his shop's going to close because he's not going to make the money that he was making in New York. I said, but you, you have your sanity. You know, you, not yeah. everybody that's walking in your show, in your store is wearing rainbow everything and pentagrams everywhere and want, a homosexual satanic tattoo. Yeah. yeah. And you're not looking at, at men that are six foot eight and six foot nine wearing mini skirts and, mm -hmm. you know, fake, fake boobs and trying to look like a woman, but clearly they're a man, you know, and they're, they've got long hair and lipstick and mascara, but it's clearly a man. You know, and they walk in the shop and flirt with him. Oh. And it's like, are you here to get something? No, get out. You know, but wow. he doesn't have it who he is now. You know, and was that, you said that was in New York? It was in New York. Wow. I'm sorry, what were you saying? You know, it's it just now he gets, you know, a different type of attack, you know, the Nobody, there's a lot of people, like, he's done some tattoos, but, you know, there's a lot of people not coming in his shop now, you know, and he said he's missing out because he was making millions in New York, but he was doing tattoos that he shouldn't have done. You know, he, back years ago, he's been an artist for 30 years. So years ago, he used to do the satanic tattoos and not think anything of it. And then in the last like 10 years, he realized, I can't do these. I can't be doing these kind of tattoos on people. He was like, I'm possibly cursing them by having these things on them. Mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, I'll be... got... Go ahead. I've got, um, I did three interviews with him. I mean, he was stayed at my house for about a week. And I did three interviews and it was, what kind of tattoos will you not put on people and why? And so we did two podcasts like that and then another podcast of why he doesn't do anime. And then all of those, I think, have been, I think they've all came up by now. And it, Is it on your audio podcast or your YouTube channel? Yeah. yeah, it's on my Spotify. Okay. And is it Zachary King? What's your Spotify name? It's uh, allsaintsministry.org. And then it shows a picture of uh, front and back of America's medal and two red candles. Okay. All right. So they can check that out there. Right? So, okay. So moving, that's a bummer because, all right, I'm going to go there. I, and I know I ju you just put your arm up. I'm like, oh, you got some tattoos on you. I don't know if they're recent or, or in the past, but I have heard that that's just like, um, what is the word I'm trying to say? Damaging your body, mutilating. That's the word mutilating your body, whether it's Jesus is the cross, it's Mary or whatever. You're doing something to God's body. And I have pierced ears. So I've mutilated my body by poking holes in my earlobes, but I don't know where I heard that. I'm just wanted to throw that out. Um, because someone actually, I, I think I also heard on Relevant Radio with Patrick Madrid called in and said, am I going to go to hell uh, because of my tattoos? And he's like, I don't think you're going to go to hell because of your tattoos. And then the person asked, will my body, when it's resurrected, have tattoos on it? And <laughs> Patrick's like, I'm pretty sure no. <laughs> so, I mean, even if they're holy, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but. That's what I heard, and I've never been a tattoo person, so it doesn't really concern me. But if anyone's considering it, I don't know. I just had to put my two cents in, as I always do. 
the Vatican doesn't take an official stance on tattoos. In the Bible, there's only one reference to tattoos. It's from the Old Testament. And it's when it's during a time when people were tattooing the likeness of a dead relative on their body and then worshiping them like a god. So we were told not to do that. It doesn't say don't get tattoos. It says don't do this. Now, it also wouldn't say, if you're reading a Bible that says don't get tattoos, they didn't have that word back then. Right. The word tattoo didn't exist back then. Um, the tattoos that I have are all Catholic. I have here a rose given to me by Our Lady. On the inside of the form, I've got the first half of a Hail Mary. On this side, I have the second half of the Hail Mary. On this side, I have a Latin phrase. That means I fear no evil. Um, this side's not done. This side has from the elbow to the armpit, it says divine mercy. From the underarm, it says Saint Mom, pray for us, because she died the year that I was getting this arm done. Um, at the top here, I've got uh, a Saint Benedict crucifix. In the four quads, it says 2013. That was the last time I did my Marian consecration. And I've always done them at the Feast of the Annunciation. So it says Annunciation across the bottom. And then on the Hail Mary, I have a honeybee. It's um, if you have a devotion to the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit is the spouse of the Blessed Mother, I brought the Holy Spirit in with the Blessed Mother. And then I've got a ladybug above the crucifix and the ladybug was named after the blessed mother and so i brought the ladybug close to jesus and then when my tattoo artist was doing jesus he said how do you want the face of jesus i said take artistic license and do whatever you feel you should do it's not something i'll be looking at every day i'm not going to see it that often but other people are going to so put whatever you think you should. So he did it. And then, you know, it's wrapped up in saran wrap for a couple of weeks and they put a salve on it to help it heal. And then I was back in a studio and I was looking at it in a mirror and I was like, whoa, that's the face from the Shroud of Turin. He goes, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. And I said, you didn't look at your phone or anything when you did it. He says, dude, I'm Catholic. I know what the Shroud of Turin looks like. And I did Is it that on your back? No, that's on the side. Oh, okay. I, I can't see because you're... Okay, move over to your right. or Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, got it. Okay. Wow. All right. I mean, you know, like, how can I argue with all that beautiful religious catholic stuff on you on you know on this side, on this side what, what's not done but i want to get done i want to do the saint benedict crucifix again but in the quads i want to put fssp and down down below it it'll say extraordinary form uh the, the back side from the armpit to the elbow will say ephesians 6 and on the front side under the arm it'll say theotokos all right. Are you addicted to this? Because a lot of people get addicted to the tattooing, the like pain. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't gotten any ink since 2016. So I haven't had any ink in years. Wow. You know what stops me from getting ink is money. You know, back is then I had. I, I've, I don't know. I don't know. Is it expensive? But if you're going to get a good artist, yeah, it's going to be expensive. Um, when I first started getting tattoos, it was, I think, 125 an hour. And then, oh. and then uh, this took four eight-hour sessions. Oh, geez. And this took two eight-hour sessions. So it'll take two more eight-hour sessions to finish it. Wow. And because I was driving from Lehigh Acres to Tampa, um, he was knocking off like uh, $25 an hour, I think. So it was 
cost me instead of 150 an hour, it cost me 125 an hour. And then I had gotten a deal. I got some priests that saw my work and they wanted to get tattoo done on them. And they all wear cassocks. So no one will ever see their tattoos. Mm -hmm. And so they got permission from the bishop. You know, the bishop's like, as long as no one can see it and no one ever sees it, except you and whatever priest is living in your rectory, I'm fine with that. So I got a deal for them. I said, well, you know, this is what I pay. And they're like, well, that's fair. You know, everybody pays the same thing. So well, I'll ask him what, he, what he'll do. So the first discount he gave them was 33% off. He goes, it sounds like a good number. So <laughs> I, I brought them that. I said, they said, he said it'd be 33% off. So I mean, I pay 150 an hour minus $25. So you would pay 150 minus 50. It'd be a hundred bucks an hour. You know, and they're like, yeah, we can afford that. We, we have nothing else to spend our money on. You know, their food and electricity and rent, all that is paid for by the diocese. So, mm -hmm. you know, they were like, yeah, that, that's problem. Yeah, no problem. We'll do that. Then when the first one went in there to get his stuff done, he was getting ready to leave. He's been there for a few hours and he was ready to pay the hundred dollars an hour. And the tattoo artist said, oh, you're a priest, you're a Catholic priest. I'm Catholic. I've got an answer for what I've done on judgment day. I give it to you for half price. <laughs> I thought he was going to say free. <laughs> no, yeah, half price. You know, uh, so seven dollars an hour. Oh, that's so funny. That you know, I know of, he got six priests, and they all got like eight hours per time. They sat there for the entire day and got stuff done. One of them wow. got like uh, a jungle foliage done all over from the wrist to the shoulder. And then in between uh, vines and trees, he would have pictures of saints and then a banner underneath them saying who it was. Yeah. And it was saints photos or pictures all the way down his arm. Wow. I think he was doing that for both arms. Ow. <laughs> Just... No, it, it doesn't it, it it really it doesn't hurt that bad hmm. some of it some of it tickles some of it you can't feel at all some of it when i got divine mercy done on the back side of the arm there was no mercy for that one it, the, whole <laughs> thing, the whole thing hurt now my oh, latest okay. idea, my latest idea i don't know that i'll actually do this but i try and make all of my tattoos catholic so what I was thinking of, I'm a huge fan of Scrabble. So I thought I would put a Scrabble board on my back and I would call it God's Scrabble board. And all the words on it, because you know, you have to connect all the words in Scrabble. So mm -hmm. all of them will have to connect, but it'll be like God, uh, the Holy Spirit, Theotokos, Jesus, um, a bunch of saint names, a bunch of words that are Catholic all over the board. And then you have you have your little tile holder where you put all your letters and you try and come up with your words. So one of the tile holders will say Yeshua, one will say Lavina, one will say Vivian. Those are my kids' names. Oh, that sounds complicated and very big, but... <laughs> Oh, I, I told Tommy who I am about that idea. He goes, let's not even look at the money. He goes, just you have to clear like three years of your calendar. Because I was picturing it in my head. I'm like, that's a lot. That's a lot. Too funny. Okay. Well, all right. I, Off the, wait, go ahead. Finish up. When, when I was looking at getting a different back piece years ago, um, my artist said, that's going to take, even if you did it like, Every other month, we did a full day. We're looking at three years of work. Hmm. Yeah. He goes, and I'll give you a good discount. He goes, I'll give you a good discount on it, but it's still, you're looking at eight hour days every other month. Hmm. And then and you I can't never, even feel it. <laughs> I never got that idea. I never did it. It was a custom 
my blessed mother. Mm. And, and she would look like, um, she'd look really hardcore and like she's ready for battle. Yeah, that's cool. But I, I, oh. I never did that one. All now, right, also, we got to move on from tattoos. No, you go. Are you still going? <laughs> one more thing. One more thing about tattoos. Um, as much as I've heard tattoos are bad, but but I don't hear how those people address the Crusaders. When the Crusaders went out to fight, they tattooed every part of their body, their face, their neck, their hands, their arms, their legs, their torso, their back, everything. Because when you're in battle, you could get anything cut off. And you want to make sure that body part gets a Christian or a Catholic burial. Yeah. You know, your foot's going to be buried with all the other feet unless it has a Catholic slogan on it or it has a saint name on it. It's like, oh, he's got St. Bernard written on his foot. We should bury a Catholic. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy, this guy lost his arm. But there's nothing Catholic on it. Bury it with the heathens. You know, right. like this guy's got an arm. He's, he's missing an arm, but, it, you know, it has five saint names on it. They're Catholic. Let's bury it with the, the Catholic saints. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear arguments from both sides on that. And it just reminds me again of, you know, the pagans and the different cultures and religions who paint their faces. May not be tattoos, but, you know, I mean, gosh, look at the people who paint their faces for sports events. How pagan is that? <laughs> Although I know it's not a tattoo. It's kind of okay, the you know, other side of that. One more thing to say about it, and then we can move on. Okay. People say that it's the temple of the Lord. You show me a temple that's not decorated, and I will show you a cult. Uh, okay. Jehovah's, Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses don't allow paintings or pictures of any kind to be put in the kingdom hall, and they are a cult. Okay. All right. Moving on. <laughs> We'll let all everyone mull all this over. Okay, so, okay, you just talked about what types of spells you would put on people at your level, the difference between, you know, Wiccans and other people out there put casting spells. So how can someone keep an eye out on their kids, on their house, their family? Like if thing, what should people be looking for in to see if they are being cursed, not hexed, cursed with spells and things. Well, you know, you need to see what's happening in your life. Now, you know, I've had some people say, well, everything's going right until I decide to go to confession. Well, that's the devil. That's just the devil's tricks. You know, it's like you had a full tank of gas yesterday and today you have a quarter tank. You know, that's just the devil directed somebody to steal some of your gas. You know, he did something to you. He, he made you turn right instead of left. You ran out of some glass. Now you've got a flat tire. You're supposed to be going to confession and you can't. You know, that's just the devil being the devil. You know, once he commits to something, he can't change. Um, but how to figure out if you're cursed. You want to do a fast. You want it to last for about 30 days. Now, fasting doesn't have to be from food. You can fast from anything. Anything you like to do that's not religious, you can fast from. You know, so if you like cigarettes, you smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. Now you're going to smoke one. Not one cigarette, one pack. You still get a full pack. But you only get that one pack a day, not three packs a day. You love documentaries on Netflix? Well, instead of watching two or three a day, you watch one. We watch one a week. Now, every time you fast, you say, I'm fasting with this intention. If you're fasting for an intention that you have a curse on you for, so demons are attacking you through this curse, they'll attack you even more if they are attacking you through this curse. If they are not attacking you. Give me an example, like a specific example that will help us follow a little bit more. Your daughter doesn't listen to anything you say. No. <laughs> Why is it a daughter? 
Because I've got two. I love that remark. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Daughter doesn't listen to you. Keep going. But she used to. She used to. And at a certain point, but you can't pinpoint exactly when it was, she stopped listening. And you wonder if that's a curse because all the rest of them act fine, but her. And some of them are older than her. Some of them are younger than her. What is it about her? What did she do? Or what has happened? Or what is, I don't, just, I can't figure this out. So I fast for 30 days. I give up whatever it is I give up. Now, you can also invent a fast. Like, you know, in, when you buy the big bag of Snicker bars and there's these little bitty things they're called fun size bags, or fun size yeah, bars. The size and the fun size that you and I grew up with. Yes, I know that. Yeah, the, the, the fun size bar to me is the jumbo bar. You know, that giant thing, that's the fun size. But take that fun size bar, that little tiny one, and cut it up into three pieces. If you can have one of those pieces a day. So that little fun size bar is now going to last you three days instead of you polishing off the bag in one day. So you've invented your own fast, but it works because. It's killing you. You want that old bag, but you're limiting yourself yeah. to a, a candy bar every three days. So, and you're offering that up and you say, I am offering this up so I can figure out if my daughter brought a curse upon my family. If she doesn't have a curse, she's just acting this way because she's a teenager and that's what they do. Then the demons will leave you alone. But if the demons did cause a curse, then the demons will attack you more because you're attacking them by fasting. So in, in that case, the demons would then what? Make the daughter or just your family in general argue more or not listen? Or how, how do the attacks come more? You could end up with all your family acting like her. You could end up with fights and arguments every day. Um, you could end up with everything going wrong with your vehicle, not just the stuff that you can routinely fix. You know, you can obviously add more gas to the tank or put air in the tires, but now the alternator goes out, the battery goes out, um, the hubcaps all get stolen, but you're in a good neighborhood, you know, and it, everything that could go wrong is going wrong. You know, you, you ride to work on a, a way you always go, but this day the car goes out of control and you flip it twice and land in a ditch. You can't explain how that happened. It just happens. Um, you know, you almost lose your job or you do lose your job. And even through nothing that you did, the boss just comes to you and say, hey, we're cutting back. You're gone. See ya. Mm -hmm. And you know, you just asked, if this is a curse, I'm fasting for this, you know, and you're waiting for the demons to attack you. They're attacking you now. So you know there's a curse. Now, how do you get rid of that curse? It's going to take deliverance and it's going to be hard because you don't know exactly what the curse is. You may have to sit down with the daughter in question and ask her a bunch of questions. Call me when you sit down and ask her to ask her questions, call me, I'll give you questions. You know, By the way, we gave its number on the last video. If you want to go back and watch the last video, just saying. You gave your phone number, you gave your, you know, email, I think, something else for everybody. It was great because you were talking about miraculous medals that you had that were blessed. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. If people want those miraculous medals or St. Benedict medals, we have both that are blessed. Uh, and we have way over a thousand of each. Um, I have two benefactors that buys me stuff. Um, you know, my email address is mysticforgod at yahoo.com. M Y S T I C F O R G O D at yahoo.com. Or my phone number is 802 578 6554. Um, my website is allsaintsministry.org. You know, I have a Twitter page, but I don't think I've posted anything in like five years. I've got a uh, Spotify. You account. haven't since they're not calling it X. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got a Spotify account. And at the end of May, I'll have 240 podcasts up. 
we post one a day, Monday through Friday. And I've currently got 120 done. At the end of the next month, I'll have 140. And that will carry me through from June 1st to December 31st. And those podcasts are helping people with the spiritual war? It, it, it helps you with everything. There's, um, there's almost any question that you can come up with is addressed in those. Okay. You know, and, and if you have a bunch of questions for me, that I and mean, this is anybody that's listening, and you'd like me to address it in a podcast, email me. You know, we get a lot of our ideas from there. Cool. Okay, so but, now yes. you're getting attacked. Sorry, we're going back to the. Did I just? Did you want to finish something there? My podcast go anywhere from a minute to fifty four minutes. Yeah, I know the feeling. I was supposed to have ten minute podcasts, and they're typically between twenty and thirty, sometimes forty, sometimes fifty, rarely fifty. But I know it depends on the topic. You know, when you get passionate about something and you can't, right. can't stop talking. It. So, all right. Well, thank you for that. I'm sure that the listeners can tune in. Do your titles help clarify what the topic is, or does it say episode 142? Well, for a while we had people that said, "Why don't you just name them? Just number them." So we started doing that, and so we have about 20 to 25 that are just numbered, and you have no idea what it is. You just have to listen to it. But then we have so many people complain that you don't tell us what it is. It's like, you asked to not hear what it was. We were doing what we could to please you. So now you're saying yeah. you're not pleased. I, this is just an example of nobody's pleased with everything. So, right, exactly. So most well, of them are named. Most of them. The, the longest one we have is the one uh, with me and Guadalupe talking about how we found each other. You know, the saint that helped us find each other. Like, they were praying... Their family was praying to St. Joseph to find a St. Joseph, and uh, which I don't think I am. And I was praying to St. Expeditus. Yeah, I wanted to, I remember last time I said, I wanted to hear your story and how you guys met too. But we haven't even gotten to your conversion and how you <laughs> left all of this. So let's cover that. Um, okay. Okay. You're... You're living the luxurious lifestyle. You've got, you know, a big home. One might call it a mansion, multiple cars. You've got an incredible wardrobe. You're pimping the chicks and you're doing all this stuff as the high priest. High wizard. High wizard. My bad. Thank you. Um, and you're like, okay, I'm done. So how does one who has all of that stuff, and I know you had mentioned, well, it wasn't really mine. Right. Um, you you tell me a little bit about the difference between how could this not be yours when you're living in the house, you've got the cars and all of that, because if I were to leave it, you didn't take any of that stuff with you right. when you left. So why don't we start from there? Tell me about how did you get sick of the lifestyle that you were living? When you can sin all you want. Yeah, you can do anything you want. You know, there, there's no law against you. You can do anything. And when you first start out, when you're first given the keys to the kingdom, you're like, sign me up. Where do I start? So you start where most people would start with sex. And sex and drugs and drinking. And just going out and living the party lifestyle. Showing up in California, leaving my mansion, driving a Lamborghini Diablo up to a nightclub. And when you get out of that car, you get to park in the VIP parking. You walk in the front door. There's a huge line that you don't have to wait in line for. And you just walk through the front door. And can I ask you real quick? Can I interrupt? Are you in your makeup when you're like this? Or are you just you? Sometimes. Some, okay. Sometimes. So not all the time. All of that. Sometimes I have put a spell on myself that I am somebody else. So they see me as some famous actor. But if you caught me on camera, I don't look like that actor. I just look like that actor to the people that are seeing me. And I look really? nothing. But that's, that's who I spell myself to look like. 
Just yeah, the person crazy. that do the chicks that are on your arms see you as that person too? Yeah. Wow. Who did and you what? make yourself be? What's that? Who did you make yourself be? George Clooney. Spell yourself be. George, George Clooney. <laughs> I thought he was a nice looking guy and I thought, well, let's yeah. see if this works. I think he's, I think that man is evil. Uh, <laughs> I really do. I really do. Well, anyway. you know, the only proof I would have that he's evil is that he met with Barack Obama at the White House. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what, the only so, so elaborate on that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, Barack Obama wasn't, he's the, the worst president we've ever had as far as abortion goes. And anybody not think Barack Obama still running the country? <laughs> yeah, even Trump says that. Yeah. And, I mean, it's funny for him to say that. I think a lot of people, you know, know that. I think he even said that, as a matter of fact. Obama said, oh, the perfect thing would be to, for me to have another uh, four years and not do anything but be in the basement, talking to someone in an earpiece and calling right. the shots. And, even though he's this little guy and many, many levels above him are where those people are calling the shots. Obama's not that big. But yeah, I think he's evil too. But anyway, this isn't a political thing. This is reality, I think. Anyway. So, so you don't think Barack Obama's the Antichrist? <laughs> uh, do I think he is the Antichrist? Yeah. No, not the. He, he's, one the small, he's one of the small Antichrists. Agreed. Agreed. But I'm not in this. Go ahead. Father Blunt said last year that God transported him to be in the office of the Antichrist and that he's not allowed to tell anybody who it is, but it's somebody everybody would know. Think of who is it out there that everybody would know? Barack Obama. Yeah. Everybody knows Barack Obama. Now, some people say they think it's our Pope. But not everybody would know our Pope. Well, if you think about that, then not everyone would know Barack Obama. I think most people would. You know, like I'm thinking about the third world countries that, you know, I think the Pope might be more known. And that's just off the cuff. I haven't thought about it much other than two seconds as I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm trying to think of the people that are out, out, out there that don't have TVs and I don't know. Interesting. Something to think about. When the, when the Antichrist comes out and we find out who it is, one of us is going to call the other one and go, I told you so. <laughs> and I'm not saying that the Pope is the Antichrist either. I'm just saying like, who would know, you know. See, I, don't oh, think it, I don't think it's the Pope because not everybody knows the Pope. Yeah, but then I argue not everyone knows of Barack Obama, but who would be the more popular of the two? I I don't know. I hmm. Yeah. And and who else would be that popular? Michael Jackson, but he's dead. Or is he? <laughs> right? Well, in that respect, do you think Epstein's dead? And do you think he was murdered? Right, exactly. Oh my gosh, we are so getting off topic here. <laughs> How far down the rabbit hole can we go? Right, exactly, exactly. Okay, all right. Um, all right okay, go back. <laughs> back up, back pedal. Right, right. Okay, so now you're, it started with George Clooney, who, by the way, was, I don't know, there was a picture of him in a boat with Barack Obama, um, let alone at the White House, so... I digress. Oprah Winfrey, everyone knows her. Does it have to be a man, the Antichrist? No, but I've heard that the Antichrist is gay. Oh, not surprising. And I've heard that from Protestant sources and Catholic sources. Oh, there you go. Barack Obama married Big Mike. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And you've obviously seen that their little daughters, look at, we are so going down the rabbit hole, do not look like them at all. That yeah, it, but it looks it, like it looks like the best friend that visits their house all the time, and who gave birth or birthed, I should say, the two kids. Yeah, it's insane. 
oh my gosh, people are like, conspiracy theorists. I thought we were watching. <laughs> I thought we were watching this Satanist conversion to Catholicism. But I truly believe that when your eyes are open, you have eyes to see differently. So do you see the world different, obviously, than when oh, you were? Well, yes and no. I mean, I used to think, what are people looking at? Why, why, why can't you just see it for what it is? But then once you come out the other side, like when the first time I saw Pope Benedict's picture, I thought, I do not want to be in a, a room alone with that man. I don't know why, but I don't want to be. I was scared of him. Hmm. I was terrified of Pope Benedict. And then when I became Catholic, and I saw that picture again, I was scared to see it because I knew that I was scared of him. But I saw him again, and I stood there and just stared at his picture for a while. And I realized what it was that I was seeing that I was scared of. He has love in his eyes. Hmm. It's the love in his eyes that I could see. And I was a Satanist. I'm not attracted to love. It's scary and something I don't want to feel, even though I'm not consciously aware of it. Right. You know, that's how Satanists can identify a consecrated host, is that the love of the host makes them feel violently ill or makes them angry. And it's because they don't realize that God is pure love. And that's what they're feeling. Did you ever come into interaction or encounter the Eucharist? I know maybe you didn't uh, perform Black Masses, but... I know you, I think, attended one, didn't know what it was. Did you feel that same way? I attended two, and it was like theater. So I was pretty mm -hmm. far away from the stage. And somebody had to explain to me everything that was happening. And I was told that it's a satanic church service. And so it didn't make any sense because I grew up Baptist, and it was nothing like this. And... So attending that, and then they pull out this thing. It looks like a vanilla wafer. And I said, what's that? And he says, oh, some religions believe that's God. And I said, well, we do a remembrance ceremony every three months. And if you're a baptized Baptist, you're allowed to participate. You take a little piece of unleavened bread and then a thimble of grape juice. And um, it was the worst tasting piece of bread I'd ever had in my life. And, you know, I, I don't know, thinking it's God, but all the wafers are good, but I don't know if I'd go that far. And um, so I didn't realize what was happening at the Black Mass until I went to my first Catholic Mass. And then it was like, oh, okay. So they did <laughs> everything. They, they had, you know, the, the fake priests go down the aisle and I mean, did they do everything that was in the Catholic mass or just yeah. the consecration part of it? They did the part. Now I'm going to get these parts wrong because I don't know what these things are called. When the priest dips the scepter into the bucket of water, I'm sure none of these are correct terms and then sprinkles the audience. You know what that's called when the priest walks back and forth down the aisle and yeah, dips blesses. the scepter. He blesses us, yes, but it's not called the scepter and it's not called the bucket of water. Um, I've told this story to priests and they've corrected me and told me what it was, but I still don't remember it. So anyway, they had something like that and they dipped it in a bucket of urine and blessed everybody with urine. And then the altar was a nude prostitute. And... The Eucharist was a stolen Eucharist. And then they also had at the end, everybody was going to go up and take a Eucharist on the tongue. But the Eucharist that we all took was a small piece of bloody goat meat. And so it was that we, we, we recited the uh, Hail Mary backwards. And and that's put up on the wall. It's projection screened up on the wall so you can read it. 
And so you're doing the whole thing. And that took us well, at least a half an hour to do the whole thing. Wow. And then uh, but there were there were no uh, mysteries with it. And then we did the mass, and every time they would say the name of the devil or Satan, they'd bang a gong. And then in the end, they pulled out this um, the actual Eucharist, but they didn't call it a Eucharist. And this guy flipped it off. Another guy did an elbow down on it, like a wrestling elbow. Uh, some guy punted it like a football. Um, there's a few things happened, and then a woman sexually assaulted it, and then they threw it in a fire. Oh. You know, I'm just so confused. Like, like it, it's a yeah. Cookie. Why are you doing? <laughs> what are you stuff? doing? Yeah, what are you doing? Like, it's not making any sense. And then the second oh. time, I, I didn't have anybody sitting with me to describe everything, so I actually walked out because I didn't understand what I was seeing. And it wasn't until, like I said, I went to the Catholic Mass and I see the priest on the altar and the, the tabernacle and the host. And then suddenly I was like, oh, dawn rises over marble head. I get it. <laughs> right. Wow. Oh, poor Jesus. Mm. Okay. All right. So... You're George Clooney, <laughs> according to what other people see. You're, you know, you're taking advantage of this life, and then yes, you, you know, so much sin, so much sin. How much more sin can you get after you've sinned and sinned and sinned and all that? Gets boring after a while, probably, huh? It gets very boring, and I know there are people that say, "Oh, put me in the lifestyle," but I don't get bored. I don't bet you do. You know, it's like, how many abortions can you do before you're like, "Oh, I got to do another one." Okay, fine. You know, um, you know, I was tired of doing the abortions, not because I'm sinning and I grew a conscience. I'm still sinning and still don't have a conscience. I just know oh, about most things. Um, I just, I'm tired of doing it. You know, can't I do something else? Is this all there is to do in this coven? Um, you know, you can only sleep with so many hookers before they all look like you can only drink so much booze before it all tastes the same. You know, you start worrying about taking drugs because now you're taking, if you look at how much you take now and how much you used to take, like, you know, it used to be able, I could eat like a couple of mushrooms and I did it. Now I have to eat like an ounce of mushrooms. The mushrooms aren't going to kill you, but how, how much is too much? And am I going to find out what too much is? You know, am I going to take too much of something and not come back? You know, and really at that point, what I even care? You know, it's like I've, I've done so much at this point, I don't want to do anymore. But the thing is, when you've reached that level of Satanism, you feel like, and you're being watched all the time. If you don't do what's always expected of you, they'll think you're changing. They'll think, oh, maybe he's found God. Maybe he doesn't want to be a Satanist anymore. Maybe something's wrong. We should watch him more closely, scrutinize everything he does. Yes, you know, so I wanted to make sure they don't do that because if they do, they'll find out that I'm pilfering money out of my own bank account. And, you know, if they research it, they'll see the money that's missing, you know, and I'll be found out. And I don't want to be found out. You know, so after I've gotten everything that I think it would take for me to live for a while anyway. I plan my escape and I'm going to drive to the uh, satanic doctor. I've got to drive on the interstate to the last exit. So I did that. But instead of getting off, I stayed on the interstate and I kept driving. I drove out of town. My car ran out of gas. I parked it on the side of the road, spent the night in the car. Next morning, I hitchhiked to the next town got there and sold my car for scrap and bought a Greyhound bus ticket to get into Canada. And I got there and they rejected me at the border. This was 1999. Nothing had happened yet that would keep us out of Canada without a passport. 
And so they opened up a... Is there a reason why they, why they shut you down? No, oh, they just okay. said, you don't have a passport. We're not letting you in. Oh, okay. I thought you had but a passport. 9-11 hadn't happened yet. You know, so there currently wasn't a reason for them to say no. Okay. So they reject me and they, I open up a United States Atlas and they say, we'll take you wherever you want to go. The only place you can't go is Hawaii. Okay. So I close my eyes and just put my finger down, open my eyes and I landed on Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was like, okay, so I'm going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, but instead, well, I actually landed on Broken Arrow. I was like, never heard of Broken Arrow. So I went to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And when I got there, you know, I was the last person to get off the bus. And there was another, there was a girl and her mom waiting. And I started talking to them. And they found out that I'm actually homeless as of now. Now that I've stepped off the bus, I don't have a place to go. And I thought they were going to recommend a homeless shelter. And instead, they recommended their house. So I got to stay at their house for my first about month in town. And they put me in contact with the Baptist church there. And the Baptist church got me a hotel room for about a week. And then, and I was going to that church every Sunday. And they got me in touch with um, a Baptist couple that was older. And they said that I could stay at their house until I found my own place. And they helped me get a job. So I went there and I got a job and I was living there for a while. And I did all this. I lived off the grid for about a year. So like nothing was in my name. I ended up in a house where I got to rent a bedroom in this woman's house. But I didn't have to have the phone, utilities, nothing in my name. And and did you that, have a job? Yeah, you get I had a, a job. Paycheck and a bank account and stuff like that? I did, but I did it in a way so that my social security card had gotten wet and one of my numbers looked like a nine instead of a three it's supposed to be a three so they made a contact they made a copy of it and i saw it and i was like oh you know i could have said this isn't me it got wet and the numbers changed but i didn't so for one year i worked with the different social even though hmm. It has my name on it. It just yeah. has a different number than what is mine. And then at the end of that year, I got by then I'd gotten a job someplace else. And I went back to Social Security and said, I need a new card because this number's off. <clears throat> and I'd filed charges, I mean filed taxes the year that it was off. And I got a tax refund. But and, and it came to me at my address. So, but I was, I still felt like I was still being legal by doing that. And then I got the, the social in my own name, but by then I had legally changed my name. And. Oh, you so did. I, okay. So I lived there for two years and then I tried to get into Canada again and I failed again. And I was heading back to Oklahoma and my friend called me, asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, I was trying to get into Canada, but I failed. And he goes, oh, here, try this one place. You can drive right across the border. It's not a big deal. There's no border guard there. Okay, great. I'm going that way. So I went that way. I was about two hours away from it. And I suddenly got so tired, I couldn't keep my eyes open. So I stopped at a rest stop so I could take a nap. Except that when I woke up, it was the next morning. And I thought, well, this is crazy. I was only tired enough for a little nap or well, whatever. So I went to the bathroom, came back to the car, got in, cranked it up, and started heading that way, figuring I'll be safely in Canada in two hours. When I got to the border, I crossed it and I got pulled over. Border guard checks my car inside and out, top to bottom, the whole time telling me about his life history and telling me that he's been trying to get this job for three years. And today is his very first day on the job. And I thought, God has got a sense of humor. If I Did you really think that at that time? Yeah. Okay. If I had driven over the border yesterday, 
I'd safely be in Canada now. But yeah, I just mean the God part, you know, like, oh, funny God, or were you still like, I don't know if there's a God. I'm, or did you always still believe that there was a God, even though you were doing satanic stuff? I guess that was more or less my. Well, question. when I grew up, I grew up Baptist, mm -hmm. and I believed in God. My first and second coven both believed in God. They don't necessarily believe in the God that's in the Bible, but they still believe in God. You know, they believe there is something up there. We don't exactly know what it is, and he's the enemy to the God we worship, and we don't know how strong he is, you know, but we believe he's there. So, yeah, I, I believed, you know, I, I'd be safely in Canada had I just driven across, but God made me tired enough to sleep the entire night. Right. So I'm worried. Yeah, that's your reason. <clears throat> and we will soon find out. I have $18 and <laughs> half a tank of gas. 18 bucks. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm rolling in dough. And yeah. I oh, so nobody at this time has ever tried to come get you from, you know, the people that were paying for all this stuff. No one followed you. They, you know, nothing happened. You're all, you're free and clear. As far as I know. Yeah, true. Good point. It could be, it could have been watching you and then said, oh, this guy's not doing anything. It's not even worth our time. They could have, or they could have been, you know, my, one of my priests, Father Cooney, he had said that maybe the Holy Spirit is using their fear against them. You know, when you become a high wizard, it's for life. And when you were a high wizard, you were 91% accurate. So if they came against you right now to try and kill you, and you did a spell against them for death, 91 of them are going to die. Nine of them are going to live. Who gets to be the nine that live? Right. Everybody wants to be the nine that live, but only nine are going to live. Right. And if there's 100, 91 of them are going to die. So maybe it was like that. They thought, well, maybe we should just let him go. Nobody yeah. wants to be the number one. You know, and even though I wouldn't do a magic spell now, they don't know that. You know, they don't know that, you know, once I turn Catholic, that I'm never going to do another magic spell. And they, at this time, I wasn't Catholic. Right. They may think, just living in the world, you know, he's leaving us alone. Maybe we should just leave him alone. Yeah, I can understand, like, leaving you alone up until the point where, oh, boy, now he's talking about everything, getting out there, and, you know, we haven't even got there yet because you haven't gotten your job in Virginia, right? Is it Virginia? Vermont. Vermont, Vermont. the other V state. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh. Okay. So I drive to Burlington, Vermont. I get a job my first day in town at a restaurant slash bar called Nectar's. It's um, a venue spot. So there's a stage there and bands play every night. And my first job was a dishwasher. You know, I said, I'm willing to do anything. I don't care. And I don't even care what you pay me. And they're like, $9 an hour to wash dishes. I was like, sign me up. Let's do it. So I had some spending cash. And then because the dishwasher kept calling out sick, I got his job and I was full time. So I, I you know, was plush with money. And uh, that was nice. And then... Um, I got a place to live and then I got another full-time job and then, and, and all this time I'm practicing magic. I'm doing magic every night. And even though it's, they're not like huge spells, it's not, I'm not trying to be a millionaire. You know, I'm just trying to survive as my, so one of my friends. Kind of spells you were putting, you're putting up. So what, what kind of spells were you doing at this time? Let me just ask plainly. Um, well, I'm trying to get another job or I'm a big fan of flowers, but flowers are expensive. I belong to Maplehurst Flowers, which is a club. It's like every ninth or 10th bouquet of flowers you buy, you get another bouquet for free. But, you know, I would like to be just given flowers. Have somebody just walk up to me and hand me flowers every day. So I started doing spells for that. And I started having people do that because I put the flowers in my living room. And it makes it bright and pretty and smells good. 
And if you can get flowers for free, why not? You know, I, I like, I was given flowers every day, you know, and hmm. every, every day I've got something pretty in my living room. It smells nice. End of the day, I throw them away. Next day I'm given more flowers. Not always the same person, but they're always free. So I'm having hmm. a good time. And, you know, I, I'm also doing spells. I like smoking weed at this time. So I was always doing spells, trying to find good strands of weed and cheap because I was also selling. So I need it to be really cheap when I buy it so I can resell it and make a good profit. And I was constantly doing that. And I always had, I had when, when there were dry spells and nobody else had weed, I always had it. And then there's a major dry spell at Christmas time. There's only generally one type of weed that comes out then and it's called Christmas tree and it's very expensive. And so what I would do, I had excellent customer service. I would give away anybody that had ever bought from me, ever, even if you just bought one slice from me, which is an eighth of, a, of an ounce. If you bought one slice from me at Christmas time, everybody that had ever bought from me got a free slice. So that means every eight people get an ounce. You know, so it's a total eight take eight slices to make an ounce. So if I had 240 people on my, my list, then that's quite a few ounces you're giving away. But where it comes in handy is the next year when everybody's looking at where, could, where should we buy from? Well, I got a free ounce, a free uh, slice bag from Zach at Christmas time. Let's go through Zach. You know, because the stuff I smoke will make you higher and higher and higher. And if at some point it stops making you high, that's not the stuff I sell. I want to be able to keep smoking and keep getting higher. If it's only going to get me so high and stop, that's not worth it to me. Hmm. You're talking from a former smoker. I get it. <laughs> uh. So I, where was I in this story? I'm sorry. Um, so uh, you were, I was asking you what kind of spells you were doing at that time. You got a job as a dishwasher and you were making all these spells, getting flowers. Okay. So I had gotten, at first I started out, I was a dishwasher. Then I was a doorman, which is like a bouncer. And then I was head of security. And that meant I was the head bouncer of, of two bars. And then from that, I moved to another bar where I was head of security there. And then I moved from being head of security to being the general manager. And then from that, I moved into the mall and I was a manager in training at finish line. So you're above the assistant manager and below the GM. And then from that, I was the GM of Sunglass Hut. And then from Sunglass Hut, I became the GM of Piercing Pagoda. Now keep in mind, I'm still doing magic spells every day at least one a day, usually at night before I go to bed. And in October, October 7th, 2007, I got married. My wife's name was Katie King and she had been a disfellowshipped Jehovah's Witness. And I'm thinking, how bad do you have to be to be kicked out of a cult? <laughs> Were you thinking that at that time or later? <laughs> uh, that time, how uh, bad do you have to be kicked out of a cult? So uh, she got kicked out of a cult and then she's hanging out with me and I'm teaching her about magic and how to do certain things and be certain things and um, a lot of new age stuff. And she's very excited in the stuff she was learning. And then, you know, we had gotten married in October and then December on a particular night, I did a magic spell no idea what I did it for. It wasn't important because tomorrow night I was going to be doing another one. And I went to work that day. I was the GM of Piercing Pagoda. So you don't remember this, this last spell that you did? Okay. No idea. Okay. All right, go back. So, Keep going. So I come into work in the morning and my day that I have to make isn't very big. It's, it seems like it's under $100. And uh, this woman comes up to me. She wants to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings. 
And I present her with the perfect pair based on what she has said. And she agrees, these are the perfect pair. These are the ones I want. And I'm just about to close the deal when she says, you know, actually, I'm shopping with my daughter. And when I'm done, I'll come back and I'll buy these. And she walks away. But she had an honest face. Everybody that says that, I know what they mean is, I'm going to go find it cheaper someplace else and buy it there. But she had an honest face. I knew she was coming back. So I put the earrings to the side and I fill the hole in the display and I just waited for her to come back. And sure enough, three hours later, she comes back and we do the sale, we do the transaction, I take the money and I'm handed her the receipt. And I said, if you call this 800 number on this receipt and take a survey, you might win $1,000. She goes, that's great. I've got something for you too. And my heart went bloop. <laughs> and I thought, she's going to pull out a Jack Chick pamphlet, tell me that I'm sinning, I need to drop to my knees, beg for forgiveness. All this stuff I can't do because I believe that sold my soul to the devil when I was 13. And instead she pulls out this little cheap gold-colored piece of tin. Now, I sell gold, silver, and stainless steel. I recognize cheap. She is selling or giving me something cheap. Like if you took this and held it up next to a Coke can, the metal is so thin on this, you could probably make a thousand of these with a Coke can. <laughs> so it's cheap. You could hold this up to the light and see the light through it. And, you know, she says the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Now, I partied with rock stars. People that can write poetry and songs, and then you give them unlimited alcohol and drugs, and they will say some strange stuff. My example when I give my talks is a lot of times the first song you come out with, your release, your debut release, is the best song you ever do. That's the song that catapults you to rock superstardom. You practically become a rock god on this one song. And every other song you do supports that song, but no other song is ever better than that one. And that happened to Kid Rock. Kid Rock eventually went country because he didn't have a rock song that taught Bawa to Ba. Bawa to Ba, the chorus of that song is Bawa to Ba, da dang da dang, diggy diggy, up jumps the boogie. Yep. Yep. That's the song that beat all the other songs that year for number one. That's the song that had the number one video on MTV. That's the song that we all made number one song saying that song was better than all the other songs of the year. However many thousands of songs that were, none of them beat Bow to Bow to Dang to Dang, Diggy Diggy, Up Jumps the Boogie. Was, did, did he, did he kind of sell himself or was that just a lot of drugs and alcohol? Um, I think that we were probably in, as far as the rock and roll world and industry, I think we were ready for something new. And his was new. He had a black drummer. It was a female. He had a big blonde, I don't know, his wig or hair. And that made him different. He had a guy that was uh, a short person, like they used to call him a midget, that would come out, Joe C. Joe C would come out and rap with him. And he's since then passed away. But, you know, no other rock act had a, um, a short person, a little person on their act, you know, to come out and sing with them. Um, he would have. So didn't, didn't play for Satan, just a different kind of act, so to speak. Well, I'm quite certain that all rock stars are playing for Satan. Yeah, because I just look at him now, and he's very different. But well, he's, who he's are country. You? So, so that's what I'm comparing it to. Yeah, that she said something stranger than what Kid Rock said. Right. She right. said, "The Blessed Mother is calling you into her army," and I thought. Blessed Mother, Isis, 
Gaia. I grew up Baptist. You know how many titles we have for Mary? Zero. You know how many names we have for Mary? <laughs> Mary. You know what Mary did? She gave birth to Jesus. Do you know what else she did? Nothing. She gave birth to Jesus. We were Baptists, so we didn't hear about the first miracle of Jesus because he turned water to wine and Baptists don't drink. I was so shocked when I heard that was his first miracle. I never heard that as a Baptist. And then she fled to Egypt with Joseph and the baby, and we never heard about that either. Do you know why? Because the only thing Mary did was give birth to Jesus. But it was, was it in your Bible? You just never heard it at church? Yeah, we never heard it at church. Okay, so, but it, the, it was in still in your James, Bible, right? In the King James Version Bible. But okay. as a Baptist, you're trained. There's like 24 verses that you always quote. Yeah. And him, Jesus turning water into wine isn't one of them. Got it. So, and then she said it's very powerful. Protestants don't bless anything. So this woman represents some female deity cult. And I'm not interested because so many cults around the world are connected. And some of them don't even know it. And I'm not going to join her cult and then find out that it's connected to either one of my other covens. I'm good. So I just kind of tune her out. I just go to my happy place. <laughs> you know, I'm just uh, thinking of other stuff. And, and eventually it occurs to me, why is she still standing in front of me? Like, I have her money. She has my gold. This was one win for both of us. How do they all find me? <laughs> above my head that only crazy people can see that says crazy people come here and because they all find me even now you know if you're crazy you'll come to my talk or you'll call me on the phone you'll send me an email you know? <laughs> <I'll interview> you. <laughs> well, you'll interview me yes exactly uh, I'll rely on you so mm -hmm. you know i just i i don't know how they find me they just do and tune her back in because, you know, now I'm thinking, why haven't you walked away yet? And she says again, it's very powerful. Mm, no, I used to be the high wizard. There's between two and five of us in the world. But that number could be as low as one or as high as ten. I could have been the only one high wizard out of seven billion people. That's a power trip that I have. And you're trying to tell me that this blessed miraculous metal can touch me in some way? No, it can't. This isn't going to do anything to me. There's no power, no mystique to this. This can't do anything. If this could do anything, it would have stopped me long ago. But it didn't. So I'm going to take it in my hands. I'm going to clench my fist around it. Because at that time, I could clench stuff and tell you this was used in a death spell. This was used in a protection spell. Your friend found this at Goodwill and bought it and made up a story about it. You can't do anything. I stick my hand out. She's all giddy because I'm willing to take it. And she drops it in my left hand and I clench my fist around it. All ready to tell her these things. Now keep in mind, I was going to toss it on my floor or slam it on my counter. Tell her it's worthless. And her God is not powerful. And I thought, even if she gets mad at me, and wants to return the gold and get back her money. I don't care. Somebody else will show up today and make my day. And if she wants to call my boss, the regional vice president, and complain, my sales are second to none. My boss is not going to ever believe I was rude to somebody. He's going to think she didn't like your cologne, she didn't like your tie, she didn't like your haircut, she didn't like your suit, something like that. Nothing to do with you. So I know I'm safe in what I plan on doing. I clenched my fist around it, all ready to tell her this stuff. Except when I did, my store and my mall completely disappeared. They're gone. There is nothing there. I'm standing in a darkened void. My feet aren't touching anything. And this woman, her name is Marianne Wickman. She's not there, but I can hear her. She tells me about the magic spell I did last night. And that's of the devil. And I've split over 100 churches, and that's of the devil. And I've done over 100 abortions, and that's of the devil. 
And she says about eight or nine other sins that I've done. And everything ends with, and that's of the devil. And when I first ended up here, I wanted to hit her with an energy blast, knock her back, maybe get out of this darkened void. But now I think if I attack her with anything, she'll destroy me. You know, let's go back to there could have been only one eye wizard in the world. That could have been me. I didn't have the magical ability to hand somebody a worthless gold colored piece of tin, transport both of us to a darkened void, and me know all their sins. Her magic is stronger than mine, and I was the high wizard. I don't know what to do. I'm starting to sweat. I'm starting to panic. I can't attack her with magic. I thought about briefly letting go of the metal and seeing what happens. Am I going to fall through the darkened void and not find my way back to the mall? Am I going to fall through the darkened void and find my way back to the mall? I don't know, and I don't want to find out like that. I don't want to find out just, oh, let's take a chance and see what happens. I'm not that kind of guy. I like to plan out my events and see exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do before I do it. And I don't know what to do. And she says again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And instantly, like a grace from the Holy Spirit, I knew that that was the Mother of God, which was an extremely strange revelation for a former Baptist to have. We would rather shoot ourselves in the face with a shotgun than say Mother of God. And when I realized it was the Mother of God, Mary showed up. This is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. And she smiled. Does she look like any of the, you know, statues or paintings or anything that you've seen when you say that she was the most beautiful woman? That's one of the things I've always wanted to ask you. She does look like an image that I've seen before, but I don't know what the name of it is. And if I went to describe it to you, the image changes in my mind. Hmm. So, so I'm thinking that the image is just for me. Well, I'm not supposed to tell people. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's Sorry, time. I had to ask. It was one of my things I've been wanting to ask you. That was my personal one. Okay, so you see Mary. She's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And then? She smiles at me. Oh. And it's, it's a smile I knew I did not deserve. And she took me by the hand, the hand that had the metal in it, and she turned me around, led me to her son, which is what she does. And Divine Mercy Jesus had been standing behind me. And I didn't know what Divine Mercy was. I just knew that I had these rays of light shooting around me and under me and over me and through me. And in that instant, I knew I had not sold my soul to the devil. I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. I knew all my magic, my occult, my new age, and my Satanism was false. And I knew everything Catholic was truth. And the Blessed Mother told me my job was to help her end abortion. And I opened my step, my hand back up and I was back in my store, back in my mall. And this woman told me that she worked for Father Joe Whalen and she's his personal assistant. And he's the busiest priest she knows. He doesn't even have time to talk to her and she's the personal assistant. And while she's talking to me, her phone rings. And she goes, oh, this is Father Joe, I've got to take this. Well, you just explained all that, go ahead. So she answers the phone. It was Father Joe. And at that time, Father Joe was starting to go deaf. But he talked like everybody else was going deaf. So when he talked, I could understand him on the phone. And he says, can you hand the phone to the young man you're talking to? She's like, certainly, Father Joe. She hands me the phone. I'm shaking like Ozzy Osbourne. I'm like, hello? <laughs> Welcome to the faith. Hand the phone back to Marianne. So I hand the phone back to Marianne. He hangs up on her. Her daughter comes up to the counter, and she says, did you bring this man one of each of everything? So her daughter runs outside. We get two more phone calls, one from a woman named Laura that's a retired nun, and one from a guy named Daniel, who's uh, an art collector, a Catholic art collector. And they both had similar messages for me. And I'm thinking, she didn't have her phone out of the purse this whole time that I know of. I didn't. Like, I mean, well, I'm in the dark and void. I couldn't see her, but, you know, I never saw her text anybody anything. I don't know how these people knew to call. 
The daughter came back in with a paper grocery bag with pamphlets in it, why do Catholics believe this or do that, a Catholic Bible, and like 125 Lighthouse Catholic media discs. And then, <laughs> Those were in my journey in the very beginning, too. I love them. Ah, and then, keep going. Um, you know, when I, this woman told me where she went to Mass. She gave me the address and the priest's name and all of that. And then the very next day, well, actually, when I got home, I opened the door and my, my ex-wife, she's my wife at the time, was doing the dishes. And I opened the door and I said, hey, honey, guess what? I'm Catholic now. And in Jehovah's Witnesses, the mortal enemies are the Catholics. And actually, in the Jehovah's Witness Church, they teach you that the first apostles and the first Christians were Jehovah's Witnesses. Hmm. And you're not allowed to research it yourself. It's forbidden to do research like that. And um, so she had been indoctrinated with all that. And so she was like, of all the things you could possibly be, why would you want to be Catholic? But the next day I went to Mass and she went with me. She was, you know, supporting wife. She went with me and let's see what all the hubbub's about and see what the Catholic Church has to offer. So at the consecration, I saw Jesus. And I thought everybody in that room saw the same thing. I thought if you were Catholic, you saw Jesus. And this is the best kept secret for me in the world. Had I known that Jesus was legitimately well, tell, in the Catholic Wait, wait, got to stop you. When you say you saw Jesus. So when you the host, was he in the Eucharist? Was he behind the priest? Was he, describe what you say you saw. And no, not every Catholic sees that, but I can see why you would think that they did. It's too bad we don't. He put his hands over... Uh, the Eucharist, and when he started doing that, all of a sudden, these rays of light are shooting out across everybody. Everybody's being hit by these red rays of light. And then when he pulls his hands back, you see Jesus standing there, full. He's like five nine, um, and he's got these rays of light coming out of his chest. And so everybody was getting hit with divine mercy rays, but. Again, I still don't know what this is. And I asked my wife, I said, did you see that? She's like, see what? I said, that man up there on, on the stage. She was, that's the priest. <laughs> Looked like a stage to me. It's an elevated platform. I know. I know. I, I'm just laughing. So. so she didn't yeah. see it. Only you saw it. That's amazing. And she said, that's the priest. I said, no, not, not him. The other guy. She goes, I don't see another guy. I said, you don't see it because you're not Catholic. Again, I thought everybody there and me, but not her, is seeing Jesus. You know, my thought was, had I known Jesus was legitimately in this church, I would have been Catholic as a young boy, and you couldn't have drugged me out of that church. Right. But I didn't know. My, my, my only thing I knew about the Catholic church, every day, my dad would give me a ride to school, and I would walk home. And on the way home, I would pass a Catholic church. And the sign said, whatever, St. whatever, Catholic church. I can read that, but I don't know what Catholic church is. There was one day when I was eight years old that we came out of the Baptist church. And my dad asked me, what did we do today? We colored a picture. Well, to my dad, that's not holy enough. We need to do something more holy. So for the summer, he took us around to every Protestant church in town. And then after we would get out, my dad would ask, what'd you do today? We played find a word. We played connect the dots. We colored a picture. We made clay. Um, we made an ashtray, you know, different things like that. Little activities you do with small kids. But none of them were holy. And I guess you figured, well, you're familiar with the Baptist church. And they do the same thing that all the other churches do. You might as well go back to the Baptist church. So we went back there. My dad never took me to the Catholic Church. One day, I'm walking past the Catholic Church. Now, every once in a while, I see these men and these women standing outside. Now, at our church, 
the pastor's wife usually wears a flowery dress and the pastor wears either black, gray, or blue suit. So outside this, there was always a man in a black suit or black foot pajamas, because I didn't know what a cassock was, the yeah. black foot pajamas to me, and a woman either wearing blue, brown, white, I'm missing a color, or black. Black, it, yeah. From the top of her head down to her feet. So I couldn't tell which one of these women was married to which one of these men. I didn't know, you know, that, that there are no, you know, they're not married like that. But yeah. I don't know, I'm a Catholic. So one day I'm walking past and there's a nun standing outside that looked like love. She radiated love. It, she looked like if you looked up the word love in the, in the dictionary, you'd see a picture of this woman. And I ran up and I gave her a hug. She didn't know who I was. She knelt down and hugged me back. It's like one of the longest hugs I've ever had in my life. And then after a while, I looked up and saw my friends are way off in the distance. So I tore away from her and ran off to be with them. And the next day, my dad's giving me a ride. And I was like, dad, 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 dad. What's that? <sighs> it's the Catholics. <laughs> You read the sign. What's a Catholic? Doesn't matter. They're all going to hell. <laughs> so that was my knowledge of the Catholic Church. They were all going to hell. So when wow. I was a saint, they're going to hell. One day I'll see them there. No big deal. So wow. just so you know, many Catholics who even were confirmed Catholic still didn't know what the Catholic, I was one of them, didn't know what the Catholic Church was. So hmm. that's. Just, you're not alone back in the day, but okay. Awesome. Well, at the time that I was given the miraculous medal, me and my ex-wife, Katie, were looking for a church, but th this was the criteria. I didn't want to belong to a cult. Mm -hmm. Understandable. And she knew about the cult. Uh, she also knew that the uh, Seventh-day Adventists were a cult and that the Mormons are a cult. And then she asked me, what about Protestant churches? And I said, well, here's my feelings about that. If organized Satanism is not being told to attack your church because you're not threatening the devil in any way, why would you want to belong to that church? I mean, do you want to belong to it because they're not being attacked by the devil? Well, that means they're not doing anything against Satan. I, I don't want to belong to that church. I want to belong to the church that's being attacked by the devil because they're harming the devil. And she yep. says, okay, what Protestant churches would that be? I said, none of them. The Baptists until the mid-90s and then watered down their faith enough that, that they're not strong in the faith anymore. So there, there's no Protestant church to belong to. So we couldn't belong to the Jewish church. They don't believe in Jesus. We we can't, you know, they don't want to belong to a pagan church because I just came from that. We don't want to belong to a cult. She just came from that. What's left? Hmm. So was this before you had this happen with the miraculous medal that you were looking for a church and this was the thought process or was this after? Was, this was just before. Okay, I thought so, but I just wanted to be sure. So like, yeah, my goodness, this is you were kind of being led there, and then right. boom! Wow. Well, welcome home, brother. <laughs> and um, you know, finding out, you know, something I found out about. Have you ever heard of Catholic etiquette? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I learned about Catholic etiquette. Um, I used to go to daily mass and I could go to Saturday in the morning, but I couldn't go to the obligatory because I'm a GM, you know, I manage my store. So I could go to daily mass because it's a, you know, seven o'clock in the morning and I can make it to that. My store opens up at like nine. So, you know, everything's cool there, but I can't go to Sunday mass because I'm at work during that time. And, you know, so just, 
And, and like, like I said, I'm going to daily mass every day. And so this guy comes up to me on a Sunday mass. I haven't been able to make it to Sunday mass in six weeks. And finally I get a Sunday off and me and my ex-wife go to the, the mass on Sunday. First shock was that we get there and the parking lot's completely full. <laughs> We've never seen it full. It's when we go during the week. Right. So it's completely full. We find a place to park. It's like the last place to park. We go inside. Church is packed. Church holds like, I don't know, 1,500 to 2,000 people. It's completely packed. We're sitting on like the back row. And people had to scoot down to make room for us. Mm -hmm. And we sit down. And... At the, this was obviously pre-COVID, you know, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. Now get each other, show up, stand up and show each other a sign of peace. People are walking all around the sanctuary, shaking each other's hands. And everybody is standing up at this point. This guy walks up to me from halfway up the church and had a big smile on his face, shakes my hand, he's a hearty handshake. And he says, I go to Sunday mass every Sunday. And I've never seen you here, brother. And I said, I go to daily mass. I've never seen you there either. <laughs> All of a sudden, his smile faded, he put his hand down, put his head down, walked away from me, ashamed. Looked like he had his tail between his legs. And I thought, hmm, note to self, don't say that again. <laughs> right. I don't know why, but don't say that again. Oh, you know, that's I funny. found out, okay, Catholic etiquette. Got to be careful of those well. You know, I don't know, Catholic etiquette per se, but yeah. Um, okay, so you're obviously into the church. You're, I'm assuming your first wife converts. Well, it's actually my first wife was prior to that. And she got, we got married when I was a, I was a full blown Satanist and a high wizard. And she had never been to church. She didn't go to church. She was, uh, I don't know if you'd call her an atheist or an agnostic. And she knew what I was and she had an affair on me and I caught her having the affair. And I don't know why she thought she could get away with that, but also because I was a private investigator at that time. And, and my job in, entitled me uh, watching people's habits. So every day when she went up, would get up and go to work, if I was local, if I was staying there, um, I'd be asleep in bed. She would get up, take a shower, towel dry her hair, put on her uniform. She worked at Holiday Inn as a housekeeper. And I don't know why she did that, because I gave her $500 a week in spending cash. Now, I pay all the bills. I pay the rent. I pay for everything. All she's got to do is live in the house, keep it clean, you know, do grocery shopping, do the laundry, you know, whatever. But, you know, she wanted a job. So she got this job and she pulls in like $150 a week plus my 500. She's making bank. She's making 650 a week. And like I said, she gets up, towel dries her hair, puts on a uniform and she leaves. Then one day she gets up gets ready, takes a shower, blow dries her hair. My eyes snapped open. I was like, what? She blew dry her hair. She put on her uniform. Then she put on makeup. And then she gave herself a couple of spritzes of perfume. Hmm. I closed my eyes again. She came over, kissed me on the cheek, said she'd see me later. She walked out the door. As soon as the door clicked, I was up. My shoes were on. My T-shirt and shorts are on. I'm standing at the door waiting for her to drive away. She drives away, drives up to the light. And then another car pulls up behind her. Then I get in my Jeep and I get behind that car. She turns right at the light, which is where she would go if she was going to work. And then if she's going to work, she's going to get on the interstate and head north. Well, instead, she got on the interstate and she headed south. So I followed her. She went up like two or three exits. I followed her off the exit into a neighborhood. She went up to a house and she pulls the keys out of her purse 
And before she can stick it in the doorknob, the door opens up. Some guy grabs her, pulls her in for a kiss, and then pulls her inside, closes the door. So being an investigator, I put one of my new investigators, my brand new guys on this case. And I said, now, this was a legitimate case. You wouldn't be allowed to do the things I'm going to tell you to do. Whatever film you can get, get it. You got to jump the fence and run up to the window and put your camera lens up against it. I want the film. He goes, this isn't a real case. It's not a real case. If you get caught, flip them off and run away. You're not really being paid to, to do this. You're being paid. You're, you're being trained. So we're paying you. But this yeah. isn't a legitimate case. Do whatever you want to do. He goes, okay. And so fast forward about three weeks. We're both in the house. And I said, hey, I wanted to show you something. He says, what? I said, oh, you'll see. And so I pop the videotape into the VCR and she sees my company logo come up and she goes, Oh, it's one of your investigative videos. I said, well, it's not one of mine. It's my company, but it's not me. She goes, Oh, okay. And then it shows her exiting the apartment. She's like, this is our apartment. I went, Oh, it is. I didn't know that. There you are. Are you wearing makeup? It looks like makeup and your hair looks like it's been done. Where'd you get that done at? And she's not saying anything. So, but you're wearing a your uniform. Well, let's see where you go. And she gets in the car and she gets up to the light. I said, now you'll be turning right. And sure enough, she turns right. And she gets up to the interstate. I said, and now you'll be going right to head south. But she didn't. She headed left. I said, oh, you're, all right, she's supposed to be heading left to go north. And she doesn't. She heads right and heads south. And I said, oh, is there a holiday inn going that way? I didn't know that. And then it's like the third exit. And I said, I don't remember there being a holiday in there. And then she drives into this neighborhood. And I was like, I can't figure this out. Where are you? I've never seen that neighborhood before. And then she parks the car in the driveway, pulls out keys. I said, are you running that place too? I mean, I guess you have enough money with me paying you and you're making your own money at your job. Are you running that house too? And she's not answering any of these questions. And then you see my investigator's got the camera still on. He runs, hops the fence, gets behind a big bush, and puts the camera right up against the window. And she turns to me and says, that's illegal. You can't film somebody inside their house like that. You told me they can only film from the window if they're standing on the sidewalk in front of the house. I said, that is true if this is a legitimate case. But it's not a legitimate case. I can do whatever I want. And so then she collapsed on the floor and started crying and said that that was only sex. She only loves me. And I told her to get out. And when she opened the door to leave, the landlord was standing there. And she asked him why he was there. And he says, I'm here to change the locks. Hmm. So wow. that, 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 was, that was my first wife. That wasn't the first wife. <laughs> I didn't expect that. All right. So how many wives have you had? Three? I've had three. Okay. So the second wife, did she convert to Catholicism? I'm assuming yes. She did, she, she did convert. She had decided that she was going to study the Catholic Church and prove that they were not the one true church. Prove that they're not the first Christians prove that the first apostles were Jehovah's Witnesses and that I'm wrong about all this stuff that I'm saying and that she's right. And instead she proved the opposite. And the first mention of Jehovah's Witnesses was in the 1800s, you know, when Charles Taze Russell founded it. And, you know, she found out that everything she had ever been told was a lie. Yeah. And that she wasn't allowed to research any of it as a Jehovah's Witness. So she couldn't find this stuff out then. And so, yeah, she, she found all that and she proved that the Catholic Church was the one true church. And she was Catholic until we got our divorce. Hmm. She, when she first divorced me, she said, did I, did I give you this, these reasons already? Mm -mm. Okay. When, she, when we were going through the divorce, she told me the reasons for the divorce. Am I allowed to cuss on your show or should I? Um, <laughs> Clean it up a little. 
I don't even cuss anymore. And I used to be an F bomb dropper, truck driver. So, you know, whatever. Is it her that's saying this to you? Or? Yes, it's her that's saying it to me. She said that I was chronically ill. I had hypertension and I was diabetic. Now, I had that when she married me. And she also said I went blind and she didn't marry a handicapped husband. So how then, did that happen? When did that happen? The blind stuff. And then we'll get back to the divorce. But and then, well, let me go ahead and finish. There's only three okay. things. Right. And the All final right. thing is that I'm a crappy husband. Oh, so, honey. Yes. Am I a crappy husband? I haven't found it yet. She hasn't found it yet. Uh, OK. Wow. So. OK. So my blindness. In 2012, somebody sent me an email and it said that I answered all their questions at a conference, but they noticed that I'm very arrogant. And they just thought that I would want to know that. You know, why are you so arrogant? I typed back, you know, I didn't know I was arrogant. Thanks for letting me know. So then I asked my wife, Am I arrogant? She's like, No. I said, Are you sure? She goes, Yeah. Well, this person said they were at my conference and I answered everything. This wife or your second wife? My second wife. Okay. So you're a crappy husband. You're all these other things, but you're not arrogant. But I'm not arrogant. So, okay. well, arrogant came. We got married in October 7th, 2007. Mm -hmm. And I was hearing this arrogant comment in 2012. She was still liking okay. me at that time. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so then I called every priest I knew, and that's a pretty long list. And I told all of them about the email and am I arrogant? All of them said no. Even one of them went so far as to say, you know, some people that are well-intentioned are holding the hand of the devil and dancing at the same time. They're dancing with the devil and they don't know it. They're well-intentioned, they think they're doing the right thing, and they're dancing with the devil. And he says, sometimes it takes a long time before they open their eyes and see what they've really done. And so you just need to pray for that person. So then I still wasn't overly satisfied. Like when my ex-wife told me about me not being arrogant, she said, when everybody came to that conference, you were the only speaker. Everybody that was there was there to see you. Notice you answered all of his questions. You did. He didn't ask anyone else up there because there was no one else there to ask. Mm -hmm. You are confident in what you do. You know the answer and you're able to say it. That doesn't make you arrogant. It makes you knowledgeable. You know, she says, I, I think it's just satanic attack. So, but I prayed to God anyway. And I said, could you help me to be humble? I don't feel that I'm arrogant, but could you help me to not be arrogant? Could you help me to be humble? But, and, you know, we're all human. Could you not do it in the way you do everything else? <laughs> like when somebody asks for patience, you teach them patience to the nth degree. And by the time you're done, they almost wish they'd have committed suicide during that five-year trial. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like the, the worst thing they could have ever gone through. And at the end of it, they'll tell you, if you really want the gift, you need to pray to God and ask for it. But if you haphazardly want the gift, you kind of want it, don't ask. Right. Because you'll be tested in ways that you don't want to be tested in. And it will not be comfortable and you will not have a good time. So, and I thought, couldn't you just ease me into humility? Do you have to beat me with sticks until I want to die? Uh, yes, he does have to do that because that's his way. And the very next day, both of my retinas detached. And if you're thinking, well, how is that humbling? Go to a bathroom sometime on the interstate. Yeah. When you've got it, you and your wife, and you need to go to the men's room, but there's no family bathroom. 
And the women have already told her, you can't bring him in a women's bathroom. Even though he's blind, we don't know that he's truly blind. This could be a ploy concocted by the two of you. Maybe he's mm -hmm. got a hidden camera on him somewhere. We don't want him in the bathroom. <laughs> so you've got to wait for a man to come up there and help you. And men are not just filing in the bathroom one right after another. No, you have to wait. And then when one finally shows up, you have to ask. Yeah. You know, and if you're too shy to ask, you don't go to the bathroom. Yeah. Unless you venture in the bathroom on your own and see if you can find stuff on your own. And I don't recommend blind people try that. You know, it's like a recipe for a disaster. And my dad told me my whole life, never trust truckers, never trust bikers. They will rob you, kill you, or worse. And we heard this Harley, you could tell it was a Harley, coming from miles away. And I looked at my ex-wife and I said, that's going to be my escort into the bathroom. And she's like, you don't know he's coming here. I said, I know God. That's who mm -hmm. God will send. He'll send me a biker because my dad told me not to trust them. And sure enough, we watched the biker pull up and park. My dad would have described this man as Mr. Five by Five because he was five foot tall and five foot wide. Mm -hmm. He rolled up to us. He's wearing like a gang jacket on that has the name of some biker gang on the back of it. He's wearing jeans and chaps and then a t-shirt. And then the sleeves are ripped off the jacket he's wearing and you see his arms. His upper arms are bigger than my upper thighs. So you can see him, but you're blind? I'm confused. I have zero, zero sight in my right eye. In my left eye, I have 7% vision if I'm wearing Maui gems on a bright sunny day. Okay. So, so I, you I can see him. him for the most part. Right. Okay. So he puts my hand on his arm like you would lead a blind person. Like he's done this before. And he tells me, you know, certainly he'll, he'll lead me. He leads me and he said, do you want the urinal or a stall? And I asked for a stall. So he, he walked in, he held the door open, let me hold on to it. And then he walked in, he said, let me check it out first. And he puts the toilet seat down and then cleans the toilet seat and then gets down on his knees and cleans the floor in front of the toilet and throws all that away and tells me, I'll be waiting right outside the door whenever you're done. And I was like, oh, you don't have to wait. I've been on the road for six hours. It's going to be a minute before I get to leave. He goes, take your time. So he goes out. I lock the door. I go in. I do my business. I'm, I'm done in like 20 minutes. Now, remember that because I've gone blind, my sense of hearing picks up everything. He stood outside my bathroom door the whole time. He didn't go to the bathroom. Hmm. When I'm done, I flush. I pull up my pants and everything. I open the door. He's standing right there. And he leads me over to wash my hands. And I said, you know, you didn't have to be waiting for me. I could have found this. If you have just told me when you left, the sinks are right across from the, the door. You walk straight across and you'll find them. He goes, how would you find your way out? I said, I'll just start heading to the right, and eventually I'll find the door. He said, listen, my grandmother's blind. If somebody left her in the bathroom alone and left her and didn't come back, there'd be words. <laughs> strong words, and that person would not be happy when I was done. So I was like, okay. So he helps me wash my hands. He helps me dry my hands. And then he leads me outside. My ex-wife is standing right there. We both thank him, and I stick my hand in my pocket. He's going to pull out my rosary and tell him that I'll pray for him. But he beats me to the punch. He has a pouch on his belt, and he opens it and pulls out his rosary and says, I'll be praying for you tonight. Hmm. And I pulled out my rosary, and I said, back at you, sir. And he goes, ain't it a small world? And he hmm. put his rosary back, and he ambled away. He never went to the bathroom. Oh. Which leads I heard me that to, story, but I never heard that last part. Interesting. Which so leads me to think that maybe God sent me a guardian angel or an, an yeah. angel. Yeah. How could I have heard that story and not that last part? 
I don't know. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Wow. I said and? that interview. I said that interview somewhere else, and that's the person that told me that maybe it was an angel because I never heard them go to the bathroom. Yeah. Huh. You know that that's his job cool. was to come up there and help me, not him go to the bathroom. So, what other health issues have come your way, and do you think that this is God? Because I know you've been asked, well, is this a satanic attack or do you think God's giving you humility through illness? Um, let's see. In 2011, I had torn rotate, rotator cuff surgery. But that, they had taken my... Um, uh, an MRI of my shoulder and they'd taken it, I think like six weeks prior to my surgery. And it showed that I had a torn something and a ripped something else. Don't remember these technical terms. <laughs> and then I was going to go have surgery with the number one rotator cuff surgeon in the world, I think. And he's in Sarasota, Florida. And the number one and number two guys are in the same operating room like one is in the next room over and the same operating building. And so he goes in to do the surgery. He's cut me open. He's got the camera in there and he goes next door and gets his buddy out and he goes, I need you to come back and look at some MRI pictures and then look at the, the actual shoulder and tell me what you think. So the guy looks at my MRI photos and he says, well, this is a ripped whatever and a torn something else. And he goes, yeah, that's definitely, it's messed up. He goes, okay. And now what do you think of this guy's shoulder now? He goes, same guy. He goes, yeah. So he checks it and he goes, it looks like all this stuff was fixed probably 90 days ago. And it's just got some scar tissue on it now. He said, if you scrape that scar tissue off, you ought to be fine. Everything's been fixed. And he goes, okay. He goes, you're the number one guy for fixing these kind of things. Why did you call me over? He said, because those MRI photos were taken six weeks ago. And this is the first time it's been touched for surgery. And there's nothing wrong with his shoulder. It just has the scar tissue on it. He goes, oh. wow, you still an atheist? He goes, no, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so when he called me into his office, he asked me where we went to church. And last I heard, he had gone through RCIA and he's Catholic. Oh, how great is that? Just because Jesus decided to heal my shoulder. Mm -hmm. But then after, he'll go in for, for surgery on it. Let the guy that got the MRI see the... This was six weeks ago, but it looks like it's been healed for 90 days. Yeah. Wow. Um, in 2012, in January, I had an infection in my left foot and saying, let's say this is my foot. This bone got infected. So they had to go in and surgically remove this bone. They said when they removed that bone, my little toe would just flop around because there's no bone to support it. And it's gonna get caught on stuff. I'm gonna break it a bunch of times. I'm gonna bruise it a bunch. And it might cause me more trouble than it's worth. So they amputated it. So that was my first amputation. But I didn't get amputated because it's diabetic. They got amputated so it wouldn't cause further problems. Wow. Then in 2000, 19, I had a problem with a sore on my foot. Didn't even know the sore was there. My podiatrist found it, scraped the uh, uh, scar tissue off of it and found a sore that went all the way to the bone. And they worked on it for about six months. And I was going to see the doctor every week to get stuff done to it. And finally, I ended up with an infection, but we didn't know I had an infection. I had gotten up and walked into the bathroom and I fell. And then I did it a second time, fell twice in the same day. 
So the nurse, we called the nurse and the nurse said, take me to the emergency room. So we went in there and they checked. I had an infection, but they couldn't tell what kind. And so they were doing blood work on me and it took them like two or three days, found out I had sepsis. And then while I was in there, I was on dialysis and my doctor about my foot came in to check me. And cause he was gonna be doing surgery on me the next day to clean it up. And he looked at it and he goes, uh oh. I said, uh oh, doesn't sound good. What's that? <laughs> and he says, you've got gangrene. I've got to take your foot. Huh. And he's like, we'll take it about here. And I'm like, you, you, you're talking pretty nonchalantly about taking my foot, Doc. I, I kind of like that foot. I like it where it is. It's nice and decorative. I've had it for 50 something years. I kind of like to keep it a little longer. You know, yeah. and he's like, got to take it or it's going to kill you. All right. So that was the worst day of my life. That that wasn't the, the day I lost it wasn't the worst day because by the time I lost it, I resigned myself to losing it. Mm -hmm. You know, so they took it off. Now the worst pain I've ever had is when I woke up and the pain meds had wore off. Oh. And that was horrible. And you know, they're saying we can't give you medicine until the doctor says yes. I said, give me the doctor's name, give me his number, call him, let me call him. I said, I'll convince him. And um Maybe just a lot of heavy duty screaming into the phone would convince him I'm in pain, but they didn't do that. They, the, the doctor ended up calling them and yelling at them because they're like, I just cut off his foot. He's going to be in pain. Yeah. Why are you going to wait on me to give you permission to give him pain meds? I told you what to give him. And, um, so they gave me that made me a little happier with that. Um, and I, I, my foot got chopped off the day the quarantine hit, which was like March 1st, 2020. Wow. So it's been it's the day before that, that I've been able to walk. And May 14th is my first day of physical therapy, learning how to walk again. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that'll, okay. That'll be a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, but. I'm training to walk again, so it's something I really want to do. Yeah, with your prosthetic foot, I would assume. Yes. Now, wow. I've got a lot of numbness in this hand, and one of my doctors said that if it keeps not getting enough blood to it, they might have to take the hand. And I said, if you took my hand, can I get one of those pirate hooks to go in it? <laughs> and he goes, well... Yeah, you probably could get one of those. Uh, My right eye is already blind, so I can get an eye patch there. And I already found out from the people that gave me my prosthetic leg that I can get a peg leg for eighteen hundred dollars. So I <laughs> in my right in my right leg, I can get the pirate hook hand, and I can wear the eye patch. Then I just got to get a fake pirate up on my, or a fake parrot up on my oh, shoulder yeah. <laughs> and track the thing hard. Oh my gosh. Well, at least you have a sense of humor. Every time somebody asks me a question, I'll be like, Arr, let me see. No, <laughs> You'd actually be pretty good at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if, we if are you almost. Say that again? If you don't have your sense of humor, what have you got? Right, exactly. Speaking of sense of humor, this girl's got to go to the ladies room and it's two hours and 30 minutes that we've been on this call video, I should say. Um, so there's, there's no way to pause it for you to go and then come back. It's, there is, I don't think so. Um, well, there's a pause button, but boy, dude, if I screw this up, that would not be cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like after all, all this time, like there's a pause, there's a pause button. I could, I could try don't, it. Don't risk it. <laughs> I could try it. And since this is so long and we actually had a couple of like moments of interruption, I'm going to ask that you stay on this, but you could like turn off somehow. You, I think you can turn off your camera because then I'll get your local. Remember we tried to do that the first time and I screwed up and there were really important things that you were saying. And we had a couple of delays, at least on my side that, 
you know, when you were talking about the Catholic faith and all this kind of stuff. So the last thing I wanted to ask was, and you got, can you make it short? How did you and your wife meet? I mean, seriously, you were, you, you told me that was the longest podcast you have is you two and how you yeah. met. Yeah. So it can't be long, but I am curious about how that happened. A friend had told me about St. Expeditus and I didn't know anything about him. And she told me the history of St. Expeditus. And I decided that he sounded like the saint that I needed to find me my future wife. So I started praying to St. Expeditus and I named everything specific of what I wanted, what I wanted in a Catholic, what I wanted in like extracurricular activities. I want a woman that loves to go to adoration. I want a woman that hopefully goes there every day and that she loves the Catholic mass, but she likes the traditional better than the Novus Ordo and that she understands spiritual warfare and that she, she doesn't want to date. She wants to court and that she wants to, and, and courting is always heading towards marriage. And so that's what we're going to do. And if she's the perfect woman for me, but I also wanted, I have certain likes, physical likes in a woman. Like one of them is that I want my girlfriend to be under five feet tall. When I first got her, she was four foot 11. Then she found out she, got married. she got married at the doctor's office. She was really four foot nine. <laughs> you know, when I stand up, I'm six foot three. So I'm 18 inches taller than her. I'm like score for me. Um, you know, if, she, if she's overweight, I don't care. I just want my wife to be healthy and she's not overweight and uh, her body to me is perfect and she's beautiful. I mean, did you see the, I don't, I don't know. You're on my newsletter. I, am, I don't have your newsletter, but last time that we um, had an interview, she, I saw her face and her hair came over and I'm like, Oh, you're beautiful. And I said, I got to figure out how to get you on this. So, no, but how do I get on your newsletter? How do people get on your newsletter? If sign you up on your website? website? Yes, sign up on my website. It's allsaintsministry.org. Allsaints.org. Okay. And allsaintsministry.org. And Ministry. it'll say on the newsletter, click on that. I think you have to give your first and last name and your email address. And then we'll collect that and we put it on a list. And then once a month, sometimes more often, we send out a newsletter. So she was praying as well for her husband. And how did the actual meetup happen? She was praying for a St. Joseph. And her kids were praying for a St. Joseph. Her kids wanted a dad. And she wanted a husband. But she was thinking, you know, if it doesn't work out, God, then it doesn't work out. I don't, I don't care. You know, I'm kind of happy being alone. You know, I have a job. I go to church. I take care of my kids. You know, and that's all she does. <laughs> You know, I run a ministry and I go to mass and I answer a lot of questions every day, emails, phone calls, you know, and, you know, I, I've only started doing the podcast since I got married and, you know, it was, um, you know, it was just difficult in a way being me, all the stuff that I have to do and not having the ability to do everything myself, but I could do a novena to St. Expeditus, and all that requires on my end is a rosary. You know, even, even though I don't have the rosary, I got fingers, so I can still count that way. And, you know, so I was praying to St. Expeditus every day, and I would name everything that I wanted. And then she, she was listening to the Terry and Jesse show one day, and Jesse Romero mentioned some former Satanists that had become Catholic, and I was one of them. And so she heard my name, but she didn't have time to look me up then. Then later in the day, she's um, looking for something to listen to at work. She listens to Catholic podcasts while she works. And she heard while she was looking for one, she found Dr. Christine Bacon, Breakfast with Bacon. And the guest on that day was Zachary King. And so it, it's a pretty good, pretty good interview. So she started listening to that. And she had to stop it, I think, partway into that. 
and say prayers because she said it was pretty heavy duty. And then she listened to the whole thing and thought it was beautiful. So then she started looking up everything that she could find that was about me. And she turned into like my little stalker. <laughs> she started finding all kinds of stuff that had um, me in it. And <clears throat> after a while, she was like, you know, God, I'm starting to have feelings for this man. And um, I don't know if he's single. I don't know if he's married. I don't know if he has kids. I don't know anything about him. I, I, I can't keep, you got to take him away from me. I've got to just like, stop listening to him. So she stopped listening to me. Then after a couple of days, she was like, well, you know, maybe I could just listen to one thing. I'll just, I'll just listen to one thing. So she listened to one thing and that led to something else. And finally, after it had been a while, um, you know, and I'm still praying to St. Expeditus, you know, and, you know, I'm saying I'm not rushing you because I know that you work faster than all the others. So whereas I might be praying to somebody else for five years, you might do it in a year, but I don't know. So I'm just, I'm hoping you're working for me. You know, I would keep doing the novena. And so one day this woman calls me. She wants to ask me some questions. She had a hard time buying some of my stuff. And then she told me about her daughter. And her daughter wanted to be a boy. And I said, well, could I ask your daughter some questions? She goes, sure. And so I got her daughter on the phone and I said, why do you want a penis so bad? Hmm. And she's like, what? So why do you want a penis so bad? What, what's that? I said, well, that's what makes a boy a boy. I said, you know when your little brother runs around the house naked? He's got that little thing bobbing back and forth. She goes, yeah, said, that's a penis. She goes, ooh, that's gross. I don't want that. I said, well, that's what it takes to be a boy. Why do you want that? I don't want that. Okay. So then I told her that I was going to do an Ovina to Marianne Dewar Knox. And I said, sometimes when I do this, on the ninth day, Mary fixes the problem. So let's see what happens this time. So I did this novena for nine days. On the ninth day, she came home and announced she had a boyfriend. And I said, ask her if the boyfriend's gay. No, he's not gay. Is he looking to date a guy? No, he's not looking to date a guy. Or aren't you glad you're not a boy then? And since then, we haven't heard any of this nonsense about wanting to be a boy anymore. So anybody out there that thinks their, their relative, their son or daughter wants to be a the opposite of whatever they are, I recommend Marianne Dewar of Knotts, Nine Day Novena. Yeah, so, many things, yeah, could that included. So we started talking there, but we ended up talking every day. And sometimes she would call me and I'd wait a couple of days before I called her back because I was really busy. You know, or, you know, she would text me and I'm, for the most part trying to text her back right away, but, you know, I, I couldn't always do that. And I started thinking, is this woman flirting with me? <laughs> I don't have, like, you know, when you have visual, you can tell sometimes when someone's flirting with you. Girls do certain things with their hair. Uh, guys will touch their face in a certain way. You know, and you know, if these certain cues are happening, there's flirtation going on. I don't have that ability. We're not doing face to face. And even if we were, I couldn't see her. But I told God, she needs to be able to tell me, like, she can't beat around the bush about it. She's got to say, I know you've got these problems. I know you've got issues. I am willing to take care of you. I know that it's not going to be easy. Now, the funny thing is, she said she told me that the day before I asked God to say it. Hmm. But apparently, I didn't hear it. Then the next day, she says it. And apparently, she said, in her mind, she said it twice. I only heard it said once. And I told God right then, but you work fast. And <laughs> so, you know, she told me all these things. And I said, you do know that I'm blind. I'm missing my right foot. I'm currently in a wheelchair. You know, I'm on dialysis. And she's like, yes, I know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, said, well, I still want to be with you. So we had, I had... Basically proposed to her on the phone. 
we met, met each other on the phone in June, like June 21st. And then in August, I went to Conyers, Georgia for a conference and she showed up to help me with my conference and to help me to see what everything you have to do. If you're with me all the time, what you have to do to help me. Mm -hmm. And so we did, uh, we met there in person in September. I flew out to California to meet her kids and her mom and her sisters and her brother, but her brother refused to meet with me. Uh, he disagreed with her dating me and we weren't dating we were recording. And so we're heading towards marriage if it works out. And then in October, I got hired by Christine Bacon to do a truth speakers conference. So there was a bunch of well-known people there and she got flown there by Christine Bacon as my assistant. And then in November, I spent Thanksgiving with her family. So about seven days. And then I had asked her actually to marry me face to face in August. And she said, yes. And then in December, I spent Christmas and New Year's with her family. So I was with them for two weeks. And, and all this time, as in is courtship. So there's no, we're not physical. We're not physically active. We're not sexually active. You know, we're just getting to know each other and getting to know each other's families. And so then I asked her mother for permission to marry her. And her mother said, yes. And Yay. then we said, we set the wedding day for um, March 25th, 2023. And, you know, by then, everybody was on board. Everybody was fine with us. The brother had met me, and I guess on some level, I pleased him. And I pleased him so much that they called their dad to see. If he lives in the Carolinas, and they called him to see if he was going to come for the wedding. And he said no, that, you know, he wasn't going to walk her down the aisle or whatever. And the brother that used to be against me then went against his dad and cussed his dad out for not coming. Hmm. I was like, I won somebody over. Yay. <laughs> so, so is she uh, there? Can we see her? Just pop your head in. Guadalupe is her name? Guadalupe. No, it's not live. Oh. Just say hi. Hi. No, like show your face. Get over here. I want to see you. She, oh gosh. She has um I don't know if she caught the flu or a cold, but she's oh. at the tail end of it now. Oh um. Oh, there you go. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm trying. Oh, wrong. Oh yeah, it is right here. Oh god. Oh, wait, I see a glass. I see an eye. Oh, look at you. How cute oh, you are. <laughs> Yay! There you go. Bye. Oh, finally. Finally. Now I'm going to sign up for your email and your web or your newsletter so I can see both of you. Oh, well, congratulations. What a story. What a God story, you know? If you ask for my, um, my second, my, not my second, my office manager. Her name is Kristen. If you send Kristen an email and tell her that you want the newsletter that shows the wedding photos. She can send you that one. Oh, that'd be great. So wonderful. Yay. Praise God for you too. I'm so happy for you. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for how much time that you have spent. And I just wish you all the best. I keep you in my prayers. You're on my rosary prayer list. Um, it's getting longer and longer and longer. And I really hope that, you know, God continues to bless you, bless your marriage, bless your ministry. And that you keep getting the word out. Thank you for helping people understand what's out there, how to fight against it, how to be aware of it. And thank you so much. I totally appreciate it. And this will be it. <laughs> no more part four. Unless I think of something, I'll reach out to you and we'll do it again. But um, well, thank maybe, you so much. Maybe if, if we did a part four, maybe you could take all the questions that people have asked you that you haven't asked. Will do. So if anyone has more questions, put them in the comments because I don't know if you don't tell me. If we haven't answered in part one, part two, or part three, I'm game. I'm totally game. This is like hanging out with a friend for a couple hours, you know? No yes, big, yes, no I agree. <laughs>
All right, my man. I thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful night. Hey, and if you can, you try to, I don't know, have have Guadalupe look at how to maybe just take it off or mute it off of your camera. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, we'll just deal with it with the little delays. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. God bless you, man. Thanks so much for all of your time. Have a wonderful night and an excellent weekend. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. End the recording. I'm going to end it.